ready. For the record, my name is Tania Fernandez Anderson, the District 7 City Councilor. I am the chair of the Boston City Council Committee on Ways and Means. This hearing is being recorded. It is being live streamed at boston.gov forward slash city dash council dash TV and broadcast on Xfinity Channel 8, RCN Channel 82, and Files Channel 964. The Council's budget review process will encompass a series of public hearings beginning in April and running through June. We strongly encourage residents to take a moment to engage in this process by giving testimony for the record. You can do this in several ways. Attend one of our hearings and give public testimony. We will take public testimony at the end of each departmental hearing and also at a hearing dedicated to public testimony. The full hearing schedule is on our website at boston.gov forward slash council dash budget. Our scheduled hearing dedicated to public testimony is Wednesday, May 17th at 6 p.m. And you can give testimony in person here in the chamber or visual or, or virtual uh, via Zoom. For in-person testimony, please come to the chamber and sign up on the sheet near the entrance. For virtual testimony, you can sign up by using our online form on our council budget review website or by emailing the committee at ccc.wm at boston.gov. When you are called to testify, please state your name and affiliation, residents <coughs> or residents, and limit your comments to a few minutes to ensure that all comments and concerns can be heard. Email your written testimony to the committee at ccc.wm at boston.gov. Submit a two-minute video of your testimony through the form on our website. For more information on the City Council budget process and how to testify, please visit the City Council's budget website at boston.gov forward slash council dash budget. <clears throat> Today's hearing is on docket 0760 to 0762, orders for the FY24 operating budget, including annual appropriations for departmental operations for the school department and for other post-employment benefits OPEB. Dockets 0763, 0765 to 0766, orders for the capital fund transfer appropriations. Dockets 0764, 0767 to 0768, orders for the capital budget, including loan orders and lease purchase agreements. Our focus area for this hearing will be an overview of the FY budget for the Boston Police Department with regard to revolving funds. Our panelists for today's hearing are Michael Cox, Police Commissioner, Lisa O'Brien, Chief of Bureau of Admin and Technology, Nicole Taub, Chief of Staff, Gregory Long, Superintendent in Chief, Lanita Cullinane, Superintendent Bureau of Field Services, Philip Collin, Superintendent Bureau of Investigate, Investigation, Investigative Services. I am joined here uh, by my colleagues, Councillor Aaron Murphy at large, Councillor Michael Flaherty at large, um, also uh, Chair of Public Safety, Council President Ed Flynn, District 2, Councillor Gabriella Coletta, District 1, Councillor Kendra Lara, District 
six, Councillor Julia Mejia at large. For our format for the hearing, we will, I will um, allow the administration to present on their budget and, um, sorry, first I will allow my council colleagues for an opening statement um, of 30 seconds, hopefully, and then go to the administration for their presentation. You will have 20 minutes total to present. Um, However, you want to do that five minutes, maybe 25 minutes. Um, and then round one of questions. Each counselor will have, um, considering the time and how many people are in here, eight minutes for round one. And then to public testimony, then to round two, five minutes. And round three, if time permits, three minutes in closing. Um, and then back to the chair for, um, well, we will, I will be um, allowing counselors to jump through if they don't, if other counselors in order of arrival does not have any question, then we can uh, please light up your mic and then allow additional questions if time allows. So first, um, Councilor Aaron Murphy, you have the floor for an opening statement. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, Thank you to the Boston Police Department for being here. I'm looking forward to this morning and this afternoon's hearing. Um, you know, public safety is one of the most important quality of life issues that we face here in the city of Boston. And I just want to thank you for your service and looking forward to this hearing. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilor Murphy. Councilor Michael Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I'd like to say that we boast of having the best police department in the country. We absolutely have the best community policing uh, efforts in the country and we're the envy of uh, cities our size are bigger. It's thanks to our commissioner and his team, the chief, and uh, folks that are here, folks that are in the background, and the men and women uh, that serve our city uh, every single day under some very difficult circumstances uh, and trying uh, difficult times. So look forward to the dialogue, uh, find ways we can continue this partnership, and uh, make sure that you have the resources you need to keep our city and our neighborhood safe. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Council President Flynn. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the Boston Police that are here with us. Thank you to Commissioner Cox, especially for the strong leadership you're providing as the commissioner and throughout the neighborhoods. What I want to focus in on during the, on, during the budget process is supporting our police, but also supporting our police families, making sure that they have the um, services and programs as well. We want to make sure that our police officers are not overstretched. We have enough police officers in the city, but we want to support our police families. They're really the backbone of, of um, the police work and community policing. And I want to make sure we have enough police on the street and that our police have the right training, but also the, the right health and wellness as well. Those are critical issues. Again, I want to say thank you to the police that are here but especially thanking the Boston police that are out in the city doing the job every day for us. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Council President Flynn. Councilor Coletta. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I want to thank you all so much for being here and thank you for your work. Um, I am in constant communication with police officers from A1 and A7. Um, I see them at community events. They're very accessible, so I just want to shout them out and say thank you. Um, during this process, it's our fiscal responsibility to ensure that the taxpayers' uh, dollars is being spent wisely, uh, diving into what's working and what, what's not working. Um, so I look forward to, to doing just that during this hearing and other hearings. Um, and then throughout this process is also our obligation to uphold standards of accountability and transparency for all city workers. And so I intend to uh, do just that and stay consistent. So thank you so much for being here and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Council Colletta. Council Lara. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you so much all for being here, Commissioner. Um, I don't have a lot to say that hasn't already been said by my colleagues, but I think I want to echo uh, everyone when I thank you for your service and the support. I think in my district specifically, um, Officer Joshua De La Rosa, um, Officer De Rosa, 
Sergeant Cunningham and over in West Roxbury, Sergeant O'Mara have been an incredible help to me and have been people that I can call on um, when we have issues in the community. So I just want to take my 30 second opening statements to, to thank them and thank you. And I look forward to the hearings that we have today and this process. Thank you, Councilor. Council Mejia. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm excited to be here. And again, I want to echo our gratitude for your service to our city. We really do appreciate you all. And I um, am incredibly grateful to the community engagement efforts that are being made every day to um, be present. Um, and I just want to uplift uh, Jeff um, Lopes from Mamlio and his leadership and working alongside our office on a number of issues um, that I'd like to dive in a little bit deeper into today. Council Lujan. Thank you, Madam Chair, and um, thank you to everyone for being here and for the work that you do on behalf of our city. Uh, we, as a city council, play a tremendous role in oversight and accountability and responding to community in terms of uh, issues of safety uh, around the city. Um, I know that there are some incredibly dedicated officers. I was just telling uh, Superintendent uh, Nora, I, have, I haven't seen her in a very long time, and that's probably because of me and not because of you. Um, and so I know that there's so many folks dedicated to community. I think uh, I appreciate the work that Isaac Yablo has been doing in reframing uh, what we think about and what, what we're thinking about public safety, really talking about community safety and investing on the front end to make sure that we are um, preventing um, the harms that happen when we don't provide people with the basic needs for them to be successful. And so um, I'm excited to dive into this um, because that's what the people require us to do. So thank you everyone for being here and thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councilor Lujan. Um, so uh, we begin. I wanted to uh, just make my uh, statements. I really appreciate uh, the service that you guys provide for the city of Boston. Um, and wanted to just set the tone for the conversation. I think that um, my, with my experience last year, there was some contention in terms of community advocates and uh, us, the counselors and the police department in having conversations that are difficult. Um, the you know reform is, at, is on everyone's minds, every advocate in the city of Boston um, throughout the nation is talking about um, how to police reform. Yet we have a really uh, wonderful department uh, with, of course, room for growth. I'm sure you can agree. Um, and just would like to um, welcome us all to a conversation that, um, and, I, and, I, and, and I don't want to say um, civil, because I think, I think everyone here is. Um, I, and, I, and I don't have to set the tone and ask people to be respectful because I, I think everyone is as well. Um, I ask that we are open, um, that we receive uh, each other's questions and um, conversations in the spirit of trying to uh, support the citizens of Boston and not as um, an attack. Um, and, I would, and I hope to be able to mediate this conversation in a way that everyone feels respected um, and hopefully with in integrity. Uh, without further ado, I uh, will allow the administration to uh, please state your name and, of course, uh, your position and your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Michael Cox. Currently, I'm the Boston Police Commissioner. And I want to thank you for uh, taking the time to hear us here today, particularly you uh, uh, as chair of this committee, uh, Council. Um, uh, we, we want to take this opportunity just for a second just to talk about some of the responsibilities and things that we have to do from a public safety agency. Um, this is an opportunity for us to share our, you know, our, our, our daily plan or, or things that we, we plan on doing for fiscal year 24 uh, and the budget that supports uh, the the police services that we provide to help provide uh, safety in the city and more importantly to fulfill our community policing model of how we go about doing business on a day-to-day -day basis. We all work for the public here and it's important to show you know both the council and the public um, that the police department you know, we realize we work for you all. We work for the public, we work for the city council, we work for anybody, everyone in the city. And so that is why you know, community policing is at the core of what we do and building partnerships and working with people uh, to provide public safety is really very important. Building this trust with our communities through engagement, dialogue, partnership, problem solving is the top priority in our department and, and this is what we're choosing to do every day. Um, 
we have a, a, a very large team with us here today and uh, to ensure that we're able to answer all your questions because each of us has a certain expertise that might be able to go a little bit more in detail and so they may come before you to answer some of your more in-depth questions you might have. However, by some chance, if we're unable to answer a question that you might have today, you know, we will absolutely make sure we get you that information and get it back to you um, a little later on. So we are going to show a, a little PowerPoint, um, not, very, not very long, but as, as we begin, I don't know if you can all see it. Pardon, uh, um, does everyone have a copy? Okay. Um, got it? Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. No worries. So, um, you know, from the PowerPoint Wizard we're starting to show, we have a lot of responsibilities in general as a police department, uh, and we do many different things. We clearly answer calls for 911, which the call volume for those have gone up. Um, we, we we're in a city where the population has continued to increase, and we're responsible for you know public safety regarding that. Uh, we have uh, additional requests regarding transparency and public record requests on a daily basis that has been growing over the years. Um, we're in a city and state and country, for the most part, where gun violence is, is is a growing issue and trend in general, and we're responsible for trying to certainly you know, curtail uh, some of the violence and the guns coming into the, in, the st in the city, as well as, you know, making sure that we address the, the drivers of violence in the city. Uh, and, w you know, as, as, as well as those other things that are involved, there's other things in the background that we're responsible for around terrorism and certainly now more domestic terrorism and, and, and the growing trend around hate crimes and, and hate in this country in general. We're responsible for monitoring and making sure that we, we're in the best position possible to address those issues and make sure that everyone here in this city stays safe. Uh, we go about deploying our uh, resources using a data intelligence model. Uh, we're, we're consistently evolving and, and looking at what the trends are and making sure that the, each area is, who's impacted by that is you know, not only informed, but more importantly, protected in some way, shape, or form as we deploy our, our people. Uh, we ingress, obviously investigate you know, crimes uh, that occur, but more importantly, more recently, we're certainly taking on the ownership of addressing fear of crime, which has certainly been an issue more recently in the city. Uh, we, we, we have our normal act, actual responsibilities of training new officers that come into our ranks, as well as tra training all the current officers that currently work here. Uh, with the, with the um, now the new requirements around post and certification for police officers, it's brought on a whole host of additional requirements that we have to do as far as the daily training of what we do. And as well as, you know, we talked a little bit about the prolifer proliferation of, uh, of guns that come into our city. Uh, probably the biggest issue and trend, and, and we've probably been, been doing, dealing with this for a long period of time, but maybe early on we weren't necessarily equipped to deal with it, is the struggle with mental health issues in our country, in our city in general, and the impact that that has on public safety and on individuals and also uh, certainly the issues associated with the opioid crises uh, that, that also occurs. So beside the, you know, those responsibilities I just made mention to it, you know, um, mental health is a big deal and it's a concern, uh, both not only externally for the public, uh, you know, on how we deal with it, but also internally. Uh, we have uh, our community um, street outreach team established in 2019 um, that actually helps address some of the issues that we have around that. And these officers are highly trained in, um, in, in dealing with folks. They, oh, excuse me a second. Uh, that's all right. I'll deal with it anyway. And so um, not only are they trained, but we're also trying to train all our officers in and certainly crisis intervention and how to deal with people who may be struggling with um, mental health issues and crises in general. 
we work with uh, patients and, and, and people in general more recently around this new Section 12 policy where we're maybe trying to get people help that may, might not be able to get help themselves or even understand the importance of it. You know, we're trying to partner with, with folks to make sure, particularly around public health, to make sure some of those uh, uh, citizens that are in the city are, uh, um, those needs are met in, 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 in the way that we think is appropriate. Uh, we also partner with several other groups, uh, Youth Connect, where you're trying to grow our relationship with Youth Connect, which is very, very important uh, as they provide uh, um, social workers in our stations and actually to be able to provide more social workers in additional stations to work with youth that maybe are at risk or more importantly, more, more recently referred to, you know, youth that are at promise. Of, of making sure that they have a successful life, a successful uh, career uh, in this city by providing them services and their family services uh, reg regarding, you know, some of the issues that might prevent or, or impact their ability to, uh, to, to be successful in school, to be, you know, law-abiding in some way, shape, or form, or all the other issues that might impact families, particularly youth. That maybe might cause them to go, you know, the wrong way and have a negative interaction, but certainly with public safety. You know, the, we work with the uh, hub tables in, uh, in in the city here, uh, with, with a group of folks that come together to make sure that we can actually get, with as well as certainly with the city, to make sure that we give uh, services to people that we identify or the city identifies that might need the services, whether it's um, to help them uh, in some way, shape, or form. form. Well, we do quite a bit uh, with our offices, and that's external, we talked about that, but um, we also work with our own personnel as well, uh, making sure we address uh, the, the mental health conditions uh, that this job demands uh, are as, as far as making sure our officers have access to mental health services, that they are not only trained how to deal with the public, but also are able to identify uh, issues of concern and actually have the ability to seek help uh, voluntarily or, or involuntary, for that matter. Um, those, th I think that's very important. We are uh, connecting with as many people as we can to make sure that the, the mental health of our office is strong and we're proactively doing things to to um, give officers the skill set that they need to be able to address uh, the impact of trauma that the, the job might uh, bring on over years of doing this uh, by working with Roker around uh, uh, some cognitive uh, behavior uh, uh, treatment that uh, we are going to make sure every police officer in the city is exposed to and actually gets an opportunity to uh, benefit from. You know, we do other things as well uh, around dealing with, with certain issues uh, around autism and autism awareness. We have services and, and programs to where the public can reach out to us. So if we get a, you know, when there's missing, whether it's children or uh, adults that are impaired in some way that we have a mechanism to not only identify it, but to get them to help as fast as possible or help them find uh, their loved ones. Or, or, you know, systems in place to make sure that we, we work with people with disabilities and things of that nature. And, yeah, we're good. So, highlights for some of the new proposals. Um, as I said, this won't be very long, or, or some of the things we have coming up for next year is that we're trying to bring on an additional 60 new police cadets for the upcoming year. Um, we are trying to, and well, the, the importance of the cadets is, is, is a feeder for us maybe in the future for potential police officers. It adds certainly a level of diversity to our police department and making sure that we bring on, uh, you know, certainly uh, the populations of the city to make sure that we reflect what the city looks like and, and people from all walks of life join our ranks and that that's an early entry way and, a, and an easy way for, for people to come on our job so we can actually diversify and make sure we're an inclusive police department. Um, language and communication access, we can partner 
partnering with the city to make sure that we have uh, the ability to make sure, regardless of the disability, of the language that people may speak, that we, we are a police department that has access to all folks in general. And so we're certainly working with the city to address all the issues associated with that. One of the things that I'm particularly you know, excited about in the future is accreditation. Uh, the police department is actually going to try to get an international accreditation to the Commission on Accreditation in Law Enforcement Agencies called CLIA, which is the international accreditation. We're going to go down the road of making sure that we're accredited um, by one of the premier accreditation uh, organizations in law enforcement in the, um, in the world, because it's an international accreditation. So we're going to be spending some time and effort preparing to make sure that we can meet the standards on that. And then, uh, of course, we're going to be doing some community listening sessions in general to make sure that we get feedback from the public about you know, not only what we do, but how we do it and what's important to them uh, across the board. Uh, and so uh, I may mention this earlier, but uh, one of the highlights of the budget is, is um, asking for another 582000 in the fiscal year budget to increase by five additional uh, social workers in each station and one super supervisor on the um, collaboration with Youth Connect around the social workers that I made mention of earlier around that. So, you know, our budget, I think, you know, people talk a, a great deal about our budget, which is, it is large, there's no doubt about that, but as, um, you know, you can see from the, you know, this slide and probably in the past that the majority of our budget uh, virtually is all made up of personnel costs, right? contracted uh, costs related to that. And, um, you know, if 88% 80, 80, of our, our costs are associated with personnel, then uh, the other 12% are for doing other things around staffing. And, and so, um, you know, of our overtime costs, which tend to go up every year when more in reflection on what we did last year, a good 35% of those costs are reflected in, in replacement costs. Now, the, the importance of, of the replacement costs, talking about the 35% of that, is that over the past uh, three years, certainly, um, we're averaging um, and, and I'll actually I'll save that slide for a second. We we have more people leaving than we have coming. To be quite honest, we're hiring officers each year, but the fact is we have more people leaving than coming. So we have vacancies around that. And then our replacement costs are the driver of our overtime for the most part. And because of that, um, the overtime does go up. So we're able to basically fulfill our minimum manning requirements throughout the city to make sure that we are providing public safety. Uh, in all areas of the city for all important events that occur. And, you know, going into next year, hopefully as we ad address and, and maybe hire more people, hopefully this trend will start to turn around, but currently it has not. And so um, that is a key driver to our overtime costs in general. Um, did we do that? Next slide. You know, despite uh, in, in making reference to that, the mayor has certainly uh, been co uh, committed to helping us fund classes uh, each year, as I described before. And but being down 200 offices, uh, in reference to what I made mentioned before, it makes it very difficult to catch up. Again, <coughs> the driver of a lot of that overtime. So, as I was referring to, in the last three years, we've had aver average 122 offices retire. And in the last three years, we've had an average of around 95 officers come on to the police department. You know, in addition, we've also lost some officers to other agencies in general, <laughs> probably due to the work conditions because of the mandatory overtime that we've, we've been ha having in general. Uh, and, you know, also, uh, Boston is a, is, a, is a wonderful city. It's an international city. We have a lot of events and things of that nature, and certainly coming off of COVID, those events have not slowed down. But yet, every time you have a large group of people, there's a public safety requirement around making sure that we have personnel there to keep everyone safe around that. And that's a driver of some of that, our, our overtime as well. And so, um, 
together, you know, we do have a lot of challenges, particularly driven by the number of people we have on board. But the fact is, that, you know, with the officers that we do have, our commitment to community policing, uh, the fact that we're trying to get input from the public to make sure that we police in an appropriate way, uh, that we reflect our staffing around the needs of, the, uh, of not only the city, but uh, the needs of, of actually the entire agency around mental health, around um, being reflective of the city that you all want us to be and who we should be as police in general. Uh, we're doing all we can to meet the needs of, of law enforcement as it evolves. It costs a lot to train. We have to train, but that's required. Right? We have a post requirement that asks for additional training, training but I think if we're going to do this in law enforcement, we need to train people in general because the world has changed and we have to quickly catch up to whatever those changes are real time around that. And so as we train, uh, an issue I didn't talk about, that, that requires sometimes additional overtime as well because you have to pull people off the street to train and then you have to supplement those people with personnel that we already currently have out there. So, I didn't want to be long. But that's a little summary and highlight of some of the things that we're doing. And so we look forward to your questions and hopefully answering you know, any concerns that you might have or questions about what we're doing. Thank you, Commissioner. Council Murphy, you have the floor. Thank you, Commissioner. A few, a few things I just want to highlight. Um, I can start with staffing. It's about recruitment, but also retainment. And if you could speak a little to, you talked about the forced overtime could be one reason, but also um, the low morale and bringing in 60 new cadets. I'm happy to hear that, but we know we need to hire at least a couple hundred to get to a place where we're not for, it's like we're in this circle where how, how do we fix it and get off the treadmill and get to a place where we're hiring enough people and can we get the morale up? So if you just want to speak a little bit more on that. Please. So we're doing all we can to both recruit and, and hire people. It, it takes quite a bit. I mean, we need a, uh, this issue is, is pretty important. We need a large pool of people just to hire the number of people we need because we do have to vet them as far as their criminal history and their background around that. And also make sure that, you know, they have to pass a battery of tests around mental, you know, the ability to uh, make sure they don't have any mental health issues, make sure they don't have any criminal, uh, you know, background, making sure they're suited for the job. Right? That's, a, that's a big deal in general. So we lose a lot of people in those processes. <coughs> you know, uh, morale in the police department and it is, is, is probably not very high in general, but it's not very high anywhere in law enforcement just due to, to the nature of, I mean, this is tough work. Mm -hmm. across the board. It, it, it's, you know, we are an authority figure. Um, no one really likes authority figures in general across that and, and, and regardless of how well you treat them or what you're trying to do and that's, that comes with the job but more recently uh, it's been made a far more difficult because we have to answer to the weakest link of any place in law enforcement. So if something happens in the south, in the west, you know, it could be almost in another country. It's to the point where, you know, every law enforcement person is, is linked to that person. You are just like this, what happened in California, you know, and having to answer to that. And, and it's, there's an unfairness to that a little bit. And, and very few, I can't think of any other profession that has to answer to what someone, an individual in that profession did someplace else. And so trying to, address the, you know, the mental health of the officers and more importantly to have a real conversation about what's going on here. You know, they say you know, all politics is local. Well, all policing is really local mm -hmm. too in that sense. But that's not the narrative, national narrative. It's like, no, they're all the same. And, you know, and, and we're not the same. The country's not the same. You go to different parts of the country, they're not the same. And so I think it's really important to you know, not lump everyone together. Certainly we should be questioned and challenged on are we doing best practices? Are we you know, um, certainly developing our people? Are, do they have any basically contact with the public? Are we, 
engaging the public in an appropriate way? Those are all very, very fair questions and stuff we need to work on. But um, to lump us with other places that have failed uh, over time, uh, you know, consistently all the time, mm -hmm. that makes it a difficult environment a little bit. Yeah. Um, not, we have the police officer shortage, but also detectives. It seems like the department, they say, deemed sufficient. We're, we're down about two dozen detectives and maybe a half dozen detective supervisors. How do we deal with that? So, and, and this, was, this category is going to go on every category. If we're down, you know, police officers, will we get our detectives from the officer rank? We get our supervisors from the officer's rank? You know, and, and all the way down the line. And so, I mean, we're going to, you know, address it and we will do promotions as we hire more folks. We will be able to promote and make sure that we address the investigative needs of the department. But there's an impact on that. And, and how do we make up for it? We've been making up for it through overtime, to be quite honest with you. Through overtime of people working additional hours to make sure that we address the needs of the city. We're always going to make sure uh, that we're here for public safety. And if something happens, we'll work 24-7 if we have to. There's no doubt about that, and we've done it before. But the point is, is, is sustainability, how long you can do those things. And that's why it's so important for us to get our numbers up in general. But I, I, I would say that no one has to worry. We understand our, our role, and that is public safety, and we will always be here to provide that in some way, shape, or form. We'll, we'll figure out a way. Commissioner, can I ask that you speak a little closer to the mic? Okay. Thank you. Um, lastly, um, you touched on the mental health supports, which I'm happy to hear that we're expanding our relationship with Kevin Barton and Youth Connect. It's very important that we have these social workers at our stations. And then I'm thinking about the support for our actual offices. You know, like you mentioned, it's such a stressful job. And then also training for them to make sure they're responding to calls properly. So no real need to respond, just happy that it's in the budget and you spoke to it. And lastly, I just want to uplift our 911 call center. We know they're overworked, um, understaffed, and some of that is about their work schedule and all. So maybe in the next round, we can just address that or continue that conversation about uplifting our 911 call center. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Murphy. Council Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, no pun intended, but I'll dial in where Council Murphy just left off on our 911 operators. Um, and they're highlighted, um, Commissioner, up here with responsibilities. I know we have over 600 calls, 600,000 calls for service every year, but and we have both a hiring issue and we have a retention issue. And I think this past weekend, uh, all, I think, were asked, uh, mandated or forced overtime uh, once again. So. Um, I know you and I and uh, the chief and others as well as the mayor were over there recently to get a tour and to uh, make an announcement. But I want to make sure the, the Commonwealth 911 peer support team uh, for employees uh, for crisis intervention, it, it really, and this is going to probably involve you and the chief to get personally involved in, it, it really is supposed to mirror uh, the BPD uh, stress teams. Um, and, and, and I don't think that's happening. There's a disconnect. Uh, you hear from the rank and file employees, the operators that um, need that support. And the way I look at it is that we're only as good as our whole team, right? And when that, that 911 call comes in, that's in a very important and vital function, uh, getting that information in real time, multilingual, so that our offices and our responding units are getting the data and the time and the descriptions that they need as they're approaching the scene. So uh, I wanted to work like a team, and I'm getting the sense from rank and file that it's not working like a team. So. Um, we know that we have a hiring issue, but we're now, as a result of that, have a retention issue. So I'm just going to ask you personally to get personally involved, you and the chief, to try to turn things down, turn things around down with our 9-1 operators before we continue to lose some very uh, committed, talented, and passionate 9-1 uh, operators. And then we're going to really have some problems uh, if um, that breaks down, if communication breaks down as these calls are coming in. So maybe just to touch on the 911 peer support and what can we do for these call operators in the short term? What can we do for them in the long term? No, I, I appreciate that question. So I remember the peer support that w was eventually began there. I was actually deputy superintendent when it started. So I, I remember the intent and I understand the importance of having <coughs> a, a stress, um, some type of stress and uh, mental health support amongst call takers and dispatchers in the, in the unit. It is very, very important. 
911, it, it is just, it's not even a Boston issue. It's a nationwide issue mm -hmm. around that. It's, you know, manning um, 911 centers throughout the country is very, very difficult uh, because the fact is we're in the great resignation period. There's a lot of people that are reconsidering all their jobs in some way, shape, or form. And that's a very, very difficult job across the board. I think we've done a, a great deal to address certainly the financial uh, portion of it. I believe, believe they're probably one of the, some of the high, if not the highest, one of the highest in the state right now around pay and, and, and you right. know, to make sure that we attract people to the 911 center and, and more importantly to address and show the concern that we have for the people that work there. Uh, the reality is we need to attract people to all parts right. of our job. I mean, the police department is a big organization. We have forensic scientists, we have lawyers, we have uh, HR uh, professionals, we have police officers, we have 911 call takers and dispatchers. We need to attract all type of people to our where we were, where we are, and you know, and creating a positive environment and culture is is. It's a difficult thing when you have such shortages that we have right now. I want, promise we, you I will do all I can to continue to work with the people in 911 uh, that I know very well in a lot of ways and have a great deal of respect for to make sure that they have the services they need right. around around. And we that. want you obviously as, as commissioner to know that the city council supports our 911 operators and we really need to to sort of bridge uh, the divide there that's happening there and to get things back to snuff. And then just shifting gears, uh, every community meeting, every civic association meeting I go to, it starts with our captain and our community service offices delivering uh, information to our residents in partnership. And uh, we hear it all across the city. They want more offices. They want more walking beats. They want uh, more of the uh, bicycle offices, particularly around our special events. Um, so kudos to them, as well as those that are out there doing the work of getting the guns and the drugs. Uh, off of the street, and then obviously, I uh, unfortunately, I, 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 I'll see Felipe either out in the community or on the nightly news, uh, doing a great job representing uh, the department under very difficult, trying and active situations that are happening. So, uh, I want to commend uh, the men and women that are running all those departments and divisions, and and will offer a suggestion that I will also offer to, offer to our fire department with respect to the retention. I always think that we should either have our exams. Uh, on the same day as well as our academies should be starting at the same time as opposed to going through a whole recruit investigation, starting an academy and having someone you know, halfway through the academy or just graduate to the academy and then they hop or they jump to say the fire department or they jump to another jurisdiction. Not going to solve the problem, but I think it would at least prevent some from being able to have sort of those options. I think that you need to make a decision. Do you want to be a police officer or do you want to be a firefighter? And if we schedule the exam on the same day and or if the academies are starting right around the same time, kind of makes up your mind for you as opposed to having the option of exhausting taxpayer dollars to go through background recruit investigation, start an academy, finish an academy, be on the job six months or a year, and then you hop. Um, and so I just opine. And then lastly, with the warm weather coming, my phone call started a couple weeks ago with the you know, the motorcycle brigades, if you will, um, driving dangerously and recklessly in and out of traffic, no helmets. So I don't know what the plan is uh, in addition to trying to get more guns off the street, but what is the plan to address uh, that public safety issue? And it is a, it becomes a nuisance issue that we hear from folks across the city. Um, and, um, and it's dangerous and it's reckless and it's just a matter of time till someone gets seriously hurt or, or worse. So need to figure out what our plan is heading into the warmer months about. Uh, the motorcycles and the uh, dirt bikes and and, uh, and that, that takes place across our city. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Um, did you want to? The, the, yeah, the, just oh, a little soft. What's, what's, like, what's the plan? <laughs> no, so, um, you know, um, the Superintendent Cologne might talk about it or, or Superintendent yep. Cullen. But, you know, we, we do have a plan in place, certainly, for the revelers uh, out there uh, that come out every summer. So. So we have a deputy superintendent, Deputy Superintendent Harris, who's overseeing what's called our Revelers Plan. Uh, that's the plan that addresses those issues that you spoke to, Councilor Flaherty. And um, it's, a, it's a comprehensive plan. It's a plan that we've had in place over the last few years. So we are gearing up. Um, there'll be some information going out to community groups. Um, there'll be some public announcements that have some, there have been some public announcements that have been put out through bpdnews.com relative to that, and there'll be some additional ones coming out 
Sure. And that, does that include around Franklin Park with the loud music at 3, 4, 5 in the morning when seniors yes, are calling my office yes, looking for does. help, repeatedly calling 911? It's a low priority call because it doesn't involve, you know, sort of, a, I guess, a major inaction, but it's a quality of life uh, issue that it's of concern and it tends to sort of lead to other things, uh, late night, early morning, et cetera. The plan is citywide across okay. the board. And, and more importantly, it will, you're going to hear us ask them for the public's help because those group, those large group, I mean, when they have all those uh, motorcycles and things of that nature, people, you know, we need the public's help of seeing where people are storing it. It's mm -hmm. usually a safety hazard in general with all the gasoline. And so uh, we're going to have a public information campaign around, you know, that just to make sure that, you know, that they're stored safely, that, you know, you know where they're located. and. Uh, um, we're going to ask this over public's help in that, but we do have a plan in place, and, and hopefully it will have an impact in, around um, the uh, quality of life in the city. Thank you, Commissioner. Mm -hmm. Sir, if I could Thank just add to that, that is a comprehensive plan, as uh, um, Superintendent Cullinan just mentioned, but it's a plan that involves many bureaus within the department. Yeah. But as the Commissioner just mentioned, I really want to be specific. I, I had the opportunity and the pleasure of leading that plan several years ago, and what worked is because the public they chipped in. They 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 stepped in. We need to know where they're storing these uh, these uh, motorized uh, bikes. Unfortunately, we're not going to chase somebody. We're not going to cause more harm. But our best course of action is to get them when they're idle, when they're trying to uh, gas up. And the other thing is when they're storing them. So we we saw much success when the community was calling. And again, I'll, I'll be specific. You can do it anonymous, 1-800-494-TIPS. But if you call us and you give us a location, we'll do the rest. That's how we were able to seize about 100 bikes, uh, most recently uh, at the beginning part of this year, and last year an additional um, upwards to 100, uh, above 50 um, machines. But again, it's going to take a collective effort and an approach by everyone. So we, we, uh, we welcome and we urge everyone to, uh, to contact us. In terms of the uh, other part of the Revelous program is the individuals that are coming from outside the city and disrupting our neighborhoods. Again, we can't tolerate it. We need the phone calls. And, and we assess and adjust that plan weekly. So again, we ask for your support. And when you're out with your constituents, to please remind them that they have to chip in. They have to call us. Thank, Thank you, you, Superintendent. You have it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Council Flaherty. Councilor President Flynn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. And just wanted to follow up on some of the comments on the, the police numbers we have in the city, the forced overtime. Just so, just so we're, we're all aware, Commissioner, and the public is aware, a police officer that works an eight-hour shift compared to a police officer that works a 16-hour shift. So that police officer that's on his 14th or his 15th hour um, skills are not the best at that time, diminish certainly, um, and, and a lot of stress. Tell me, tell me the impact that has on making an effective arrest, de dealing with the public, writing up comprehensive police reports. So uh, I'll say it this way, that you know, anyone who works for 15 to 16 hours a day in any profession would probably be fatigued over, mm -hmm. over time, and it would impact anyone's ability to um, actually do their job to the best of their ability, I would think, over time. And that way, that's why they, you know, certainly pilots put time limits on it. There's a lot of professions that put time limits. And we have time limits on our own personnel, on the number of hours that they work. And so, yeah, trying to limit that is, is, is very, very important. Um, I, I must admit, early on in my career, you know, I've been, so I've been in law enforcement for 34 years, you know, we did a lot of things, but the fact is, I recall when I was off, I was off. Mm -hmm. And when I wanted to work if additionally, or if I had to work for court purposes and things of that nature, it, it wasn't that kind of burden on my family and, and things of that nature, what gets into mental health issues. So, you know, being, you know, being forced to work and not being able to, to go home routinely when you're supposed to be off has an impact, I would imagine, in general, in, in anybody in any profession. And so it's something we do need to address, and we are trying to address it by making sure that when we do, you know, 
put out over time, particularly this summer, it's going to be for true public safety needs to make sure that we're, it's impacting the public in some way and that we're intentional about it as opposed to just, um, you know, uh, maybe unnecessarily, which is not the case. Right? We're doing it because we have to, but maybe, um, you know, unnecessarily, you know, having these officers work. So we're going to do it when we absolutely need to uh, or for public safety purposes and also spread the wealth in that sense. We're a big department, so we're going to make do all we can to make sure that the, our entire department helps support uh, the public safety needs of the city. Thank you, Commissioner. And I continue, as, as you probably know, I continue to publicly advocate for, in my opinion, I think we need to hire 200, 300 police officers consistently for the next 10 years. Many people disagree with me. But I think it's, it's desperately needed. I talk to police officers all of the time, and the forced overtime is having an impact. But the impact it really has, not only on the residents, but, but on the police families. And, you know, a, a police officer that's supposed to pick up their child um, at school or, or at, a sport, at their sports event, and then can't be there because they have forced overtime. That obviously causes a lot of conflict, stress in the family. Um, my, other, my other point, um, <clears throat> Commissioner, is, and I know we've talked a lot about this recently, but tell me what, what your philosophy is and what, what this budget will do in terms of the health and wellness programs for our police officers and how can we ensure that police officers police officers that need assistance can get that assistance. And so we, we have a, a, a pretty nationally acclaimed, you know, uh, wellness program in the, in the city of Boston, you know, um, certainly through the Patrolman Association. So that will always continue. But we're, we're addressing that with this, uh, you know, ROCA program. We're partnering with them. And starting July, we're going to train all our officers in this um, uh, behavioral therapy really around addressing the impact that actually trauma and stress can have on, on police officers or anyone over their career in general. And so we've make it, made the commitment to make sure that every officer goes through that program as part of all the other things that they have certainly uh, uh, are required for our post requirements and things of in, in that nature. And so we're doing that. We're, uh, we're doing more in general. We're encouraging our officers to come together uh, as a group when they can. Uh, I think, you know, out of COVID, officers themselves didn't isolate it in a lot of ways. So now they're actually participating in more community policing events in general with kids and in the public. They're coming together in their own basketball leagues and ice hockey leagues. And, you know, all of these things help the environment, help, uh, help them, you know, deal with the stresses of just life in general. So we're going to continue to always keep the wellness of the officers at the forefront of what we do, um, though we're always looking for partnerships in general. Community policing, I, I believe it or not, is so important to the wellness of not only the public and the community we serve, but to the officers. Because the fact is, you know, it's human nature. As we're around people and people understand, particularly officers, the important work that they're doing and see the impact it has on the public, and, and, and the public has a way of thanking officers. That makes them feel better about the job and what they do. It helps uh, undo some of the, uh, I don't know, negative impact that this job can have over time. And so I think it's very important for officers to get out of their cars, to, to actually go out and meet people in all neighborhoods and make sure that we continue to do what we, you know, we can to serve the public, because it actually helps officers as well, as far as wellness is concerned. Councilor Day, I just jump in real quick. Um, you know, Councilor, obviously, you know, you're well aware that you know Boston Police Department has a uh, a tremendous peer support unit, family assistance unit, that has done tremendous work over the years, and, and the work that they do has only grown. I mean, the commissioner yesterday was just talking about it, how just over the course of our careers, you know, um, the stigma that was attached, once attached to, you know, an officer having, having issues, him or her actually admitting they're having a problem and looking for help, how, you know, we've noticed that stigma um, is, is diminishing rapidly. Mm -hmm. um, I can't say enough of the programs that we have and the nonprofits that we partner with, um, not only for trauma, for addiction services, you know, within the department, you know, we um, peer support unit, you know, we have licensed drug and in, 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 um, alcohol counselors. 
Um, and again, the array of resources that are available to help officers that are dealing with you know, not only trauma that they see in the job, something that's, that's happening at their home, uh, but in combination with the job and what we talked about, the, you know, the, uh, the forced hours, which is causing mm -hmm. stress on everybody. Um, but you know, I will say that um, there is a tremendous amount of resources available. Um, there are lots of officers within this department um, that, that talk to people, they, they um, highlight people um, that they believe or need of services. Um, they make the appropriate calls. Um, I, I mean, the amount of officers that look out for one another, um, again, it, it's, it's, you know, I think there's a problem, we take a lot of pride in that, but I, I do want to highlight the work that our peer support unit and family assistance unit does day in and day out, um, and the services are available. Um, we're going to continue to grow that. Thank you, Chief. Um, Madam Chair, do I have time for one quick question? How quick? Probably like 30 seconds. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, my, final, my final point, um, I, know, I have done work in the past with the Family Justice Center. I know they play a tremendous role in the city. Um, Captain Teresa Kuzminski. Um, and one of the issues I've focused on a lot about is hate crimes and hate crimes in the city including against the LGBTQ community, immigrants and um, Asian Americans as well. Um, <clears throat> what, what impact will this budget have on making sure that we investigate, document, educate residents about hate crimes, bullying, especially against immigrants and gay and lesbian and um, Asians and um, the Muslim community? And so, uh, excellent question. It cuts across a couple of areas. One, certainly in uh, the BIS area on the investigative side, and who, um, the groups we work with around hate crimes also cuts across our both school police and community engagement, which, which does some training around um, bullying and things of that nature. We should, I'm trying to. Which one? Good morning, everybody. Um, we can certainly also share that through the BRIC specifically, we've done a significant increased amount of outreach, particularly with our LGBTQ plus community, given kind of the increased risks that exist and the large scale events that we have coming up and anticipating within our city. And so the continued funding will allow us to continue that outreach proactively while also supporting uh, the Civil Rights Unit, which does conduct investigations and has seen, I believe, an increase in complaints. Uh, in that subject matter, and certainly Superintendent Cologne can speak more specifically to the details around what the unit has seen. So thus far <clears throat> this year, the unit's seen uh, 54 cases, and uh, it's uh, 11 towards the black community, four towards the Asian community, 17 towards the LGBTQ community, 12 towards the Jewish community, and 10 towards others. Uh, an example of others would be uh, uh, another religious group, uh, disabled folks. But what I can, uh, what I want to say is that, first and foremost, I want to thank the men and women of the uh, Civil Rights Unit, as well as the community engagement and the uh, and the folks on the uh, BFS side. The proactive work, the outreach that we are doing now, connecting with these groups, partnering, and educating. That, that's the key thing, right? We have to educate folks. There are some ignor ignorant folks out there, and we have to change that narrative. And uh, I commend them. Uh, again, we are understaffed, but these individuals are coming out. They're coming out on their own time. They're coming out on beyond their hours to participate, to engage, and to educate. So um, yes, we, we need more fun funding in that area. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Council you have the floor. Thank you so much, Chair, and thank you all so much for your um, presentation. I said earlier that I would stay consistent, and um, usually what I do in these hearings is, that, is I thank the folks on the ground doing um, incredible work, and so I have to shout out folks in my district, um, Captain Bickerton, who is a fan favorite of my seniors, um, Officer Mosley, Sergeant Santolo, Hugo Alvarez, Chrissy Vrabel, Frank Champa, um, Officer uh, Chevrette, too. So I just want to say thank you all so much to them. Um, and I see Superintendent Chin and Bastion here as well. So I uh, really enjoy working with you both. Um, I'm going to focus my, question, uh, my questions on uh, contaminated drinks. This is something that I have worked on in partnership with my council colleagues, um, Michael Flaherty and Council Louis Jen. 
I know that there has been a rise in reports and incidents across the city, and um, young women and men have <coughs> contacted my office um, looking for answers and just trying to advocate. And I've talked about my own story, scary story in college, um, and you know how are we just supporting victims and fostering safe environments across the city of Boston, and just giving credit where credit is due. Um, uh, BPD has been extremely responsive and, and uh, a great partner in this work, Lieutenant D Detective Driscoll, and I have been in, in many conversations just trying to figure out how to best serve the city, uh, the residents of, of the city of Boston. Um, I know that you instituted a better internal reporting system under the Mark 45 um, drop down list where now we can track where these incidents are happening and just more data means that we're better um, able to respond to all of this. So from, I, I know that that was a, a minor change, but it's going to make a, a huge difference. So I just wanted to say thank you um, for that. From one of our hearings, there was also a commitment to assigning a detective to these cases, even in an in instance where a sexual assault is not believed to have occurred, which was a huge gap. So if somebody is coming to the police department and saying, my drink has been contaminated, or I feel like I have been drugged. Unless there was a horrible incident of a sexual assault, they were not given a detective. And so this was a gap in services. So I'm wondering if there's an update on that, um, or if anybody can, can speak to movement on that. So, Super Cam, but I would say that, you know, we've, we've taken this very seriously from the first time that we saw patterns and trends to put it out to the public, to certainly let the public know about the, the incidents, and, and we have been trying to track that in general so we can be more responsive. Super. Yes, sir. Ma'am, I want to thank you for your leadership on this issue. Uh, um, yes, we added a, a drop down to Mark 43, but in addition to that, so this isn't an isolated incident, not an isolated, it, it's not isolated to certain areas, uh, uh, to just one particular area. We're seeing it across the, uh, the city. Uh, some areas we see more. Captains have assigned, uh, so just so people understand, we have folks, detectives in the sexual assault unit, but we also have detectives in each district, in the 11 districts that represent uh, the general investigations. So there is a disconnect uh, after hours, which we are, we are addressing. So uh, detectives are being assigned. The problem is, uh, and uh, Superintendent Colony will be able to speak to a little further this, we um, recently have been in contact with uh, EMS. So we are trying to bridge that gap where we are getting notified sooner so that we can have the investigators immediately, the detectives immediately involved in these investigations. But I'll yield to Superintendent Colony. Yes, I was re re recently uh, in conversations with EMS because there were some calls that have come through and there hasn't been a police notification. And the sooner we're able to respond, we are able to collect evidence and speak with the survivor um, to figure out kind of what's going on with that situation. So we're trying to figure out ways to collaborate so that we can get that information so that reporting is done immediately so then all the things that are necessary to investigate that take place. So we are making and, sure that we're doing And just that. to clarify, those efforts, and thank you for that, those efforts are a way to um, provide more coverage on weekend nights, so Friday and Saturday. There was a, I think there, there was discussion in one of our hearings that there was only two folks um, citywide that were deployed. I, there, there might have been a, a disconnect during that hearing, but. I, I think that's a disconnect. If you're okay. referring to two detectives citywide, no. Uh, that would, again, is a specialized unit, that um, sexual assault unit, that's a different um, response. But in each district, detectives are available to respond on a nightly basis. Okay, and I think that's what it was. It was within the sexual assault unit. So I just, w w maybe we can talk offline about this and how we're moving this forward, but clearly there was a gap there, but I'm happy to hear that EMS is now being involved in, in all of this and that there's gonna be at least some response for somebody who has gone through this terrible incident. That was something that, that we identified. So maybe we can just follow up um, offline and figure out where this is going. Um, I do just wanna touch base with Youth Connect. Um, I'm happy to hear that there's an investment of over $500,000. Um, for social workers in our station. Just a point of clarification for you, Commissioner, you said uh, investment in five personnel in each station. That's something that you had said, but I just wanted to clar clarify that. No, it's, it's five that. additional um, social workers and one supervisor. So Across social. the city? Across the city. Okay, where are they being deployed? And if I could ask how many are currently stationed in A1 and A7? We currently have uh, social workers through Youth Connect in five of our district stations and in three of our specialized units. So the additional five 
uh, plus a supervisor would go towards the districts that don't currently have staffed uh, Youth Connect clinicians in them. And so we would work with Youth Connect to determine the most appropriate placements uh, based on existing needs in those areas. Okay. So there hasn't been a, a set list of where these folks are going. Do you still have to analyze that? Correct. It okay. would be dependent on the funding and how many that would support. Okay. If I can Correct. advocate for um, somebody to go into A1 in Charlestown, there's been an increase in youth um, at-risk youth behavior, and so I just want to, to shout that out and give credit to the Turn It Around program, who is really trying to um, assist those individuals. But if, if I could just advocate that we expand that program in Charlestown, I would appreciate that. Yeah, and, and in fairness, I don't want to give the impression. So they do we do referrals. They do go to other places, and, they, and they currently they still help out in, in, I believe, A1 in Charleston. I believe they had already 19 referrals. So okay. it's to grow the program across the board. And so if the ideal thing was to have one in every station, that would be ideal so they don't get pulled and go to other places. But it's to expand the program throughout the city. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you for clarification. And that's it for me, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Council Lauer, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you all for, for all of your questions. I um, have a lot of questions. So, um, Madam Chair, will we be having a second round? Yes. Okay, thank you. Great. So, we are talking a little bit about um, attrition. Can you tell me a little bit about, on average, how much a retiring Boston police officer is making once they get to retiring age and how much we're paying, on average, incoming Boston police officers? I know I see that, I see that there's a $12 million decrease in kind of like payment scale, so I'm assuming that there's some saving there for... So I want to understand your question. Are you asking about what, it, what they make when they retire? Uh, yeah, on average. I'm, what I'm trying to really ascertain is that when you're a retiring police officer, I'm assuming you're making much more than someone who's new and incoming, and so that there's a cost saving there when you're replacing people who are retiring. And so I'm wondering if you have those numbers. There's a $12 so million dollar decrease the in the budget, and I so I want to make sure that that's... The pay scale of a new officer versus the Absolutely. pay scale of, of uh, outgoing officers. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sure. Lisa. Yeah, it's, it, Good morning. Good morning. Um, when uh, the salary for an officer, when he is hired mm -hmm. um, in the academy, the salary is, is approximately seventy thousand dollars. Okay. Um, and if I would have to estimate that the officer retiring, our average annual compensation, this is a blended average for all our offices, of is approximately one hundred and four thousand mm -hmm. dollars. If an officer retires at eighty percent, meaning that they have, you know, they're age fifty five and they have thirty two years of credible service, they could go out with a pension of eighty percent. But that's an esti you know, that's an estimated of average. Course. Obviously mm -hmm. some other some offices are making more mm -hmm. and some other offices making less depending on their, their rank and their education. Of course, and this is a pay scale and so that doesn't include overtime possibility and and so on and so forth. Is that correct? Over, overtime is not pension eligible. Uh, no, I mean in terms of how much they're making oh, when yes. they're on the force. Yes. Perfect. Thank you so much. And so because that's not counting overtime, are there different overtime rates for officers depending on rank and time on the department? Yes, there is. Can well, not share? depending on, on time in the department, it's depending on rank because they are, they're paid their hourly rate, but at time and a half. Great. Can you, if you don't have that now based on rank, can you share a breakdown of how much um, different rankings on the Boston Police Department are being paid for overtime? Of course. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Um, last year, you brought us to the City Council your minimum staffing requirements. Can you share what your minimum staffing requirements are now, and are these staffing levels adjusted for this 9.4% growth in population that you shared with us? Yeah, so the minimum uh, staffing requirements really are based off of what's going on, time and place. The minimum staffing for uh, 4th of July is going to be different than, you know, the middle of October or what happens. So, so barring any special events or special right. dates, what does minimum staffing look like? And district. In so, district, exactly. Yes. So last year we got a list per district and what the staffing requirements were <coughs> for those. Did you did yes. you bring those with you this year? So I'm here for this year. Okay. Uh, not last year. I could say that, you know, we're going to be responsive in the sense that we're ref we understand the overtime delivered mm -hmm. and what it's costing one both the city and the cost on the officers. So we are trying to make sure that our overtime is reflective of public safety need of for, course. for an event. So we have a large scale event, St. Mm -hmm. Patrick's Day. We had the full event mm -hmm. this past year. We hadn't had that in years. So that was a full call out. So I appreciate yeah. that, but the, the question is not necessarily about overtime. I understand, you know, well, I have, do have questions about overtime, but this is specifically about meeting the minimum staffing requirements, right? And so what we're getting is that you're not meeting the staffing requirements. And so I want to know 
What are the minimum staffing requirements per department? How many total sworn officers do we have? And then what is the breakdown of those officers? How many are on leave? Where do they all work? Because if we are going to say to the city council, we're not meeting our minimum staffing requirements, we're understaffed, I just want to see the math, right? Like, there are this many sworn officers, this is how many are assigned to each department, and, and so on and so forth. So, if someone's gonna answer this in a second, but I Perfect. wanna say the trend of where we're trying to get to mm -hmm. is, is the staffing is gonna be reflected in, in the need. Yeah. And the need can change at any time, right? As opposed to being married to Absolutely. a number. This is, I, I understand that this is a baseline number and right. that you decide, you know, based on what happens. I would love to hear some of the either formula that you use or what are some of the considerations that you make when changing that, but I understand that obviously things fluctuate and you make decisions Correct. on the fly. And that's yeah. what it's going to be more reflective of the evolution of whatever is going on that day. Mm -hmm. uh, if we have, you know, unplanned major protests every day, it's going to change. If, if, so I don't want people to So there's to some married. discretion. Absolutely. Well, Certainly, I think there's been, but the fact is mm -hmm. that it's going to be more and more reflective in what the needs are for the city in that particular day and time. Thank and so you. I don't want to be married to a number Absolutely. yesterday, you know, for a potential event tomorrow that we don't even know. Mm -hmm. so, okay. Thank you for said, that caveat. That's helpful. I will not yep. hold you to that. No, no, no. <laughs> so, that being said, so okay. if you want to. Yeah. So, yes, we do have information relative to the districts and uh, what we call present staffing and the minimum staffing. Great. Um, mm -hmm. I can give you an example. Yes. So for District 1, our minimum staffing is 134, mm -hmm. but we are currently for present staffing at 113. Um, that is not inclusive of people that are out injured, those that are on leave, um, different kinds of leave like mm -hmm. military mm -hmm. leave mm -hmm. or administrative leave. Um, so when we talk about our present and accounted for, that's inclusive of everything. 128 is what we're at, but our minimum staffing for that is 134. So Got I it. just provide you with an example. Great. So I definitely don't need you to give me, like to read them here for the record, but yes. if you could consider this an official request to just through the chair to share what those are and where, you're, where you are, like where your minimum staffing is and what the requirement, I, uh, with the knowledge, like Commissioner Cox shared, that this is base and that it does not um, take into consideration other things that might be happening. So you mentioned that the understaffing is also a driver of overtime. Can you share what the breakdown, and again, I don't, I, you might not have these numbers directly here, so please consider this an, an official request through the chair. Um, can I have a breakdown of the overtime spending? I would like to know how much, how much is for special events, how much is for folks that are covering regular shifts, what is forced overtime, et cetera. Um, so from our total overtime spending, I would like to see what kind of overtime spending that is. And just because I know that I'm moving on to my time, I think that, we, that I would rather receive those numbers than have you respond to them unless you have them prepared. If I may, Councilor Lara, yes. there, there is a breakdown in the PowerPoint presentation that Great. covers the different categories, court, special events, uh, replacement personnel, extended tours, and, and This is calls. this budget staffing chart that is on the presentation. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. Uh, and if I have any other questions, I will ask them through the chair. There were 60 new cadets in the FY24 budget, and last year I know that we approved an extra cadet class. Is this reflective of us going back to only having one cadet class? Or are we, what is, does the 60 number represent two, one class? It represents two classes. Okay, so we're staying at two. It's with two classes. Perfect. Um, I, I, my, my question was more so because in your presentation it shows that we're not keeping up with attrition, and so I was concerned that we were going down to one class after we approved two. So the intention is to stay with two, yes. and hopefully grow the size of it to keep up with the with the gap that seems like about what 27, 30 gap in terms of how many people are leaving and how many people are coming in. Correct. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm really a big fan of Youth Connect. I've met with the executive director uh, personally. We've had a lot of time to kind of talk about the model. My question is, why is the contract for Youth Connect not in the Office of Youth Engagement and Advancement here? Why is it with the Boston Police Department? So I, I know they currently are in our you know, stations right now, and mm -hmm. they've been working with us for years. But there, there's there's 100,000 right now funded through the Shannon Grant. Which that requires to, that that 100,000 goes to the Boston Police Department. Well, it goes to, actually it goes to the Boys and Girls Club who's in charge of the Youth Connect. Okay. And basically, we, they um, basically have part-time social workers on a part-time basis, mm -hmm. you know, um, offering assistance with the various districts in, in need of 
of social work is. So how much of the total funding for Youth Connect comes to the Boston Police Department and then out to community-based organizations? It, it's it's 100000 through the Shannon Grant through external funds. And so this $500,000 increase is not through the Shannon Shannon Grant? No, it's going to be on our operating budget okay. and on con contractual services. And, and there's no reason for it being in the Boston Police Department other than the $100,000 is already there and you're kind of just increasing the budget? Well, we're increasing it with the hopes of getting the full time um, mm -hmm. dedicated solely to the police department versus now they are allocated to the police department but based on need. Thank you. I'll re reserve my questions for the second round. Thank you all so much. Council Mejia, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I just have a few questions, um, and I have a prior engagement, so I'm going to have to dip in and out. I'm curious if you could, um, what we what I'm trying to understand if it, we need to know a little bit more about the police contract increases or decreases the budget. If it increases the budget, this will retroactively increase past um, previous budget since 2020. And so what, I, what, what it's a little bit unclear to me is how we are reconciling with um, the ways to cut overtime and why it continues to be so high if last year we made a dip into it. You, your question, I, I'm a little, I don't understand. No, I, I, um, so I was trying to mix up a number of different things, but let me just keep it simple, right? So we've been always talking about how we cut the overtime budget. Right? We've been really trying to figure out how we lean into it, how we uh, um, contain it. And I'm just curious as to why um, there's still a high percentage when it comes to the overtime yeah. budget. And so you know, what I was trying to explain before, and, and I'll try again, is that we have more people leaving than we have coming. And the events and the things going on in the city are not going down. They're only going up. Now responsibilities are only going up. Our call volume is going up. The issues that that public safety needs to be more respond you know responsive to is going up. The only way that we can fit that that gap is through overtime, and that's that's how we've been kind of doing it. That's why overtime has been going up uh, around that, and, and so that's that's the reason why. Is that helpful? And, and I just want to go back to a quick question. I just want to clarify about the cadet, asked about a cadet. Did you, do you understand the difference between cadet and recruit officers that become police officers? Cadets are not police officers. Absolutely. Okay, I just wanted to make sure sometimes people refer to cadets and they, they think we're talking about police. Right. Let's talk, this is my turn now, Commissioner. Mm -hmm. I'll be giving it to Councilor Lada. We add a minute to my time, just so you know. Um, so just the homicide rate um, clearance data has not been updated since 2020, it appears, um, on the city's uh, website. And can you just share any updated information on how uh, a $71 million budget for investigative services will support increasing homicide clearances um, rates from 35%, which was the last reported rate in 2020? So how is the budget going to help increase yeah. our homicide rate? Well, so part of the budget is it, it, we, go, we talk about community policing again, and making sure that we're involved with the community, engaging them. Um, that actually has an input on clearances as well. If we get the community involved in whether it's telling us what they see, what happens, coming forward, uh, having more trust in us, that will absolutely lead to us uh, you know, absolutely clearing homicides cases a lot better. We do a whole host of other things. I'll let the superintendent uh, also engage on some of the things that we're doing to make sure that we do that. But uh, community policing is at the core of all we do. And if we don't have public trust, the likelihood of those clearance rates um, going up is, is, is not very good. So we always were looking to build upon that. And I know you gave 2020 data, but maybe we can give you some more updated stuff. Superintendent Colon. Yes, ma'am. So uh, just to, on the clearance, it's 35% this year. Uh, if you add the cases that we are clearing from previous years, we're up at 71%. And that is, for, from last year, cases, cases that are closer to the end of the year, because of uh, the way the courts operate, uh, often you'll see that it'll, it'll transfer over to the uh, following year. So 71% with cases that we had last year. Uh, I want to say that the, the homicide unit, again, 
it, it, you, we have a, a number of office investigators there. We need more. But through uh, one of the initiatives that the commission is doing now is uh, community comps that it's unbelievable because we get out, we get to get out there, we get to educate the public. Listen, I understand it better than no one, the fear, the apprehension that folks have to cooperate with the police. But we need, we need to encourage that uh, participation. We encourage, we need to improve the, the cooperation with the police department. This isn't easy, this isn't easy work. This is hard, tedious work. And it doesn't just happen between 9, 9 and 5 p.m. It is beyond the hours. So educating the folks, encouraging to, to to uh, cooperate and giving them different avenues as how they can cooperate, yeah. which can ease yeah. the apprehension and the yeah. fear. So you know, with all due respect, I see very few, I see the same officers out in these streets. And it's the same people who are at our community events. It's the same officers who are always showing up. And when we're talking about community and building trust, I just don't see the amount of investments being made to shift the culture. And I think it's really challenging for us to have this conversation around feeling safe when we see videos on YouTube of officers being really disrespectful to residents, right? So there is a disconnect here. And there's a, a culture that exists that I'm glad that we're going to be doing some training around because I just don't feel like the city really feels like they can trust some of y'all. I know I see the same people everywhere, but there are some folks who don't live in Boston who still carry their feelings about people of color and they still put on a suit and they go out into our streets and police our people. So there's that culture there that still very much exists in the city of Boston. And I think it's really difficult for us to have conversations about budget because we can't relegate and, 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 and legislate hate which is what oftentimes we feel. And so I think it's really important to name that we can't have the same people out on these streets and expect different results when there's a climate and a culture that exists. And I'm curious to that question, if you could tell me a little bit about any issues around white supremacy within the police department. So I, I you know, I can't say that I'm aware of white supremacy in the police department, because if I was, I'd, I'd eliminate it immediately around that. I can say we hire from the human race, and you know, if there's issues around race and things of that nature, um, it's not obvious to us. And the fact is, I can't say that it doesn't exist, but the fact is that people sign up for this job to help people, period. And I have no reason to believe that the ones that are here are not doing that. And if I do, then we will do something about it as a department in general. Um, you, you talk a little bit about perception. Sometimes perception is not the reality. And so we need to do all we can to make sure that the perception changes around that. Um, you know, growing our community policing, uh, it means that we need to get more officers out of their vehicles to be exposed to the public so they can get to know the officers. The more they get to know the officers, the more that fear goes down. I know you say you see the same place offices all the time. Well, you probably go to the same you know, locations. We're a big city, it's a big department. I don't know if you're out at nighttime or overnight, because I'm not. I go around the department and there's offices I don't even know and I worked here 30 plus years before I left and came back. And so I, as a police commissioner, have to go around and talk to the officers that are currently here to get to know them. And I'm always pleasantly surprised in every conversation I have. And so the more we get people to talk to officers, the more we grow our community policing and making sure officers on a daily basis are engaged in the public, the more it will address the fear around perception that you just made mention to. Yeah. Go ahead. Can I just make one comment? Yeah. Okay, um, so I, I am the, um, in charge of the Bureau of Field Services, so I oversee all of the patrol staff. And uh, I, we're really committed to getting officers out of their cars and into the community, and we know that that's something that the community deserves to have. And one of the things that I do is I will go out into the community, I will call a unit to walk with them, uh, just to um, show them and uh, by example, what the expectation is. 
And so when we talk about the places where people are seen, um, and I'm not talking about events, I'm talking about actually being in the community. So I do go to events, but for me it's more important for uh, individuals to be out in the community, getting to know community members, getting, know, getting to know business members, and I am committed to that, and I'm going to make sure that that happens. Thank you. And I can add to that on the investigative side, we, we are committed as well. We're having detectives, we're having detective supervisors step out of their vehicle, engage with the merchants, engage with the uh, community within their uh, sectors. So I would argue that, no, we are having more officers step out, uh, out of the uh, comforts of their vehicles to engage the public. No, I appreciate that. And I just wanted to, before I get my mic on mute, it's just acknowledge the fact that, you know, there's a lot of tension and there's a lot of finger pointing in terms of who has to pick up, you know, who, who, who's responsible for the violence. But we still have guns coming into our streets. We still have homicides that go um, un, un, unsolved. And there's always this, the community needs to step up. But we have a budget, which is just as big as the Boston Public Schools. And whenever BPS is not doing something right, we either shut down one of the schools or we merge them or whatever the case is, but when it comes to BPD, it just doesn't seem like, in terms of investment and how we're allocating resources, there's really no real sense of accountability. And I think that what's frustrating to a lot of people, at least when I'm out in these streets, is that they want to see you know, a return on that investment. And I know everybody's gonna have to play a role, Commissioner, I including myself, you know, and, and how we all work together. I just don't know how we, we're gonna go about getting there because a lot of this work, it's not about, um, it, it's hard work. Thank you, Council Mayor. Thank you. Council Lujan, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and I just wanted to uplift um, the work uh, that we've done alongside Council Coletta around, uh, around contaminated drinks. I wanna thank uh, the BPD for their work in that space to make sure that Boston can be a city where folks can go out and enjoy themselves without fear. Um, I have two lines of questions regarding, one regarding overtime and, and the second regarding discipline, but I also just wanna just, just state that like it is really hard to make a blanket statement that an institution or a system doesn't have white supremacy because of the structure and the nature of who we are as a country and our systems. And so I just wanna say that like the work is continual to really look at our systems and do the work of, of determining what white supremacist structures exist, even if not in an individual, the systems sometimes embed that. And it's up to us to really do that work that is sometimes hard, that sometimes live within each one of us to really undo. So I just wanted to put that on the floor. Um, one um, interesting, you know, we hear over and over again on the overtime discussions, that we hire more police officers, there's gonna be a yin yang effect. You hire more police officers, we'll see overtime go down. But there's really this issue, and we saw that recently with the federal case that acquitted the police officers in the overtime fraud case, that there is no data to support that an increase in the number of police officers will really tamper down on the culture and abuse of overtime in the department, which I think was made clear by this federal case. And so if you could talk a little bit more about what it is, what data we have to support the idea that more police officers will rein in on the overtime issue and that it is not a standalone issue of culture and use of overtime itself that is really at the root of the issue. Um, that's an excellent question uh, and a fair question in the sense that <clears throat> probably it goes down the route of, of uh, over, it goes to staffing. Do you have enough people to handle all the, all the things that you're required to do? If the scale moves, if we continue to ask public safety to do more and more and more and more, it is highly unlikely that we're ever going to have sufficient staffing to meet the needs, that so therefore we'll have to make up for those additional needs through overtime. Um, if whatever we're required to do stays stagnant, then it becomes a management issue of making sure that you know we have things in place, and then we you know manage our people appropriately, and then that 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 in theory that that overtime figure can go to zero, and when it, when we are sufficiently staffed for the things that we're required to do. But some of the when you look at this case in sp specific, when it was yeah. talking specifically evidence warehouse the abuse of 
over time. And it was the successful defense was that it is part of the culture. And so that's sort of where my question is more centered because I don't believe that an increase in officers is going to see it. We're going to see that decrease in overtime. And when I see an acquittal, and I, when I see the reasons uh, that were used for the acquittal, I'm not convinced. Yeah, and so that certainly that case is for a period of time. And then the department's been around a long, long time. And I'm sure that overtime figure has gone up and down and all things in between. I can say going forward, what are the things that we're doing to make sure that we are managing our personnel appropriately? Well, we talked a little bit about it. That CALEA accreditation I just talked about goes to our policies and procedures, and not only are we doing it, but that we're following it, and an outside independent agency comes in to evaluate us to make sure that we're currently doing to, to keep our accreditation. You know, just moving towards that, we have to do a lot of things structurally to make sure that we are effective and efficient in the managing of our personnel. Uh, I don't, that's not a thing we've done before. That's not, it, that's not a thing that a lot of people in the, in the state of Massachusetts have done. So we are absolutely committed to making sure that we, you know, are, handle our, our overtime and all our resources appropriately when it comes to that. Uh, you know, and then, you know, addressing the needs of the day. That is part of what we do. Public safety is, you know, can change from one minute to the next what the needs are. Mm -hmm. And making sure that we use our resources resources to reflect uh, public safety appropriate way. And so I can't, I don't have a crystal ball on what the future holds. I can just say what we're doing today to address these things. Uh, we talked a bit about, you know, wellness. There might have been a time in the culture of the department where over time was maybe a way to encourage good officers to continue to do good work. We are not in that day right now. Right now we're in a, a, a day where Officers don't want to work overtime. They want to be with their families. It's a younger population of officers. They're from a different generation of, of people. They they value their free time as well. You know, they they signed on to the commitment to you know to have their days off and things of that nature, and it's not happening. And they don't necessarily want it. Right? It's a, it's a different culture of people. Thank you, Commission. I'm just going to be timed. I'm okay. limited in my time on questions, so I just mm -hmm. want to move on just so that I can. Um, you, you talked about the future, but if are there, are, when it comes to the projected rate of successful medical triage, which is another issue of making sure that officers who are healthy and are able to work are back to work, um, what are we doing to, what are the new, are there any new policies that we're, we're implementing to make sure that we are able to do that so that police officers that can work are either working or if they can't work are no longer on department payrolls? I'm um, interested also as a correlate related to that, what financial controls are we implementing to both uh, do better at managing the medical triage and to, like you said, you can, we can't, if, if we're only looking forward, what final, financial protections are we putting in place um, for the future to really tamper down on, on both the overtime abuse issue and on the medical leave issue? No, and, and another good question, but Lisa, can you elaborate? I want, want to point out since August, we had 102 officers come out of um, 111F or MIS um, from injuries, um, either back at work or retired. Majority of them came back to work. Unfortunately, there are times when we're getting people back. We might get six back in a day and five go out. Um, we have a medical triage unit, very beefed up now. We have one full-time physician, um, medical doctor on staff. We have a, a nursing practitioner that's there three days a week. And we have a physician's assistant from um, an emergency room department in Boston on board for about 30 hours a week. The goal is to get officers into our office to be seen on every other week, make sure that they are well. We want to make sure that they're well enough to come back emotionally, physically, but to get them back as quickly as we can. Also, we also assigned the captain to the health uh, unit down there to, you know, really to help you know, fill the gap and making sure that where, where the gaps happen, where people weren't following up, things of that nature, that it's happening and then occurring. Um, we're doing a whole host of things around our, our, you know, we have a lot of policies and procedures, but over time I think some of that has, has gone away. We're making sure that we've tightened it up on, on many of those. Thank you. Uh, only because, okay, I, I just... If I may, um, Councillor, thank you. So just two points on that. Also re-emphasizing a culture of safety. 
and trying to take a more preventative approach to keep our officers safe and well so that they can continue working. But on the overtime question and the correlation, because it's something that I've heard a lot over the course of my career, if you look at the breakdown of categories of overtime, where we incur the largest percentage are straight replacement personnel costs. And that means we don't have an active duty or a hired officer to fill a necessary assignment, and we're incurring costs to replace him or her on the street. And so that's where the real correlation between your number of baseline active officers is going to help to reduce your overtime costs because it's going to reduce that largest category of overtime expenditures. That is frankly not, a dis it's not discretionary. It has to be filled, therefore it has to be incurred. I understand that. And just my understanding is, and I have to move on to, because I think I have 30 seconds, is that the periods where we've had the highest number of officers, we've also had the highest number of, the highest, like overtime expenditures, which is why I'm, my question, because I, I don't think that there's that correlation, but I, I take your point. Uh, just a question, on, some questions on discipline, and I may have my time cut, and so I will uh, have to send them to the chair, but has the BPD adopted or developed a discipline matrix as, um, or do you intend to do so? So the question of a discipline matrix is something that has been part of ongoing discussions and negotiations with the union. So beyond saying that, I can't offer any more detail, aside from the fact that it is certainly a consideration. Thank you. Um, I know that when we are talking about discipline and we're talking about um, holding um, both our police officers accountable, I also just want to make it clear that uh, I think that is something that we need to do and that we should do, especially when we're talking about um, w the safety uh, of our community and the, and the feelings of safety. But I also want to, just for the record, oftentimes uh, officers and whatever, whatever institution you're in, which is why the question of white supremacy is a really important one, uh, people of color, workers of color, tend to be meted out harsher disciplines for activity and actions that their counterparts are not. And so I just, I want us to develop uh, discipline uh, matrix, but I also want to make sure that what we're doing it, we're doing it in a way that is sensitive to the uh, practice of, of, of harsh punishment towards uh, black and brown folks. Also, just my last question for the record is, what are we doing to prevent another Patrick Rose case from happening, and what would the IED be doing differently today um, if that case were before? I'll, I'll answer And that. like another officer who was on our books that I, we were paying I, for. And it's very simple if someone was, you know, sustained for sexual assault, I would fire them. That's, I mean, that's a very simple case. I, I mean, it, it's a simple case today, we state, but for over 20 years, it wasn't as. I, I, you know, I can't speak for the previous, but it was a case that was sustained and went to the highest levels and whatever. And so if it were to come to me, and that's um, the ultimate decision, they would be fired. And would that be something, would that decision process, is that something that would be part of the discipline matrix that you, that, it would, that, that decision would be made that quickly? I, I don't think it's complicated. It's, it's you know, from, for me in that, in that sense, I can't speak to the matrix right now on that, but I would say you made reference to a, a case. If a case were to come to me and if someone's, you know, sustained for sexual assault, then, you know, they would not be a police officer anymore. Thank you. Madam Chair, I am. Um, Thank I, you. Um, just to my colleagues, uh, you, we do have a second round and possibly a third round. We're here all the way, uh, all day today, basically, as long as time will allow us. And, and I know that we have our busy schedules, but this here, this uh, budget schedule has been um, disseminated to all of your emails months in advance, at least now a couple of months. If you can absolutely squeeze it in your schedule to be here, it's super important. The, there, there will be a, a large a portion of public testimony this afternoon as well. And I know that the community advocates and people will want to hear from our counselors as well. But if you, your schedule does not permit, um, please, eat. right now, if you have to leave, uh, totally understandable. We all have a busy schedule. But uh, feel, please uh, try to return at 2 o'clock for the second hearing for more questions, as, in particularly on systemics, um, racism, and reform in the police department. Um, so look forward to that. Uh, Brian, uh, sorry, Councillor Worrell, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Chair, um, and thank you to our police department. Um, just want to give a few shout-outs to Superintendent Chin, Superintendent Baston, Captain Burns, Captain Flynn, 
uh, Sergeant DeVito, Officer Harris, Officer Downing, Sergeant Golden, Officer Eric, uh, Sergeant Worrell, Sergeant Crispin. You know, um, the police department has been very responsive when I've called and um, has continued to show up. So I just want to say thank you for all the hard work that you guys do here in the city of Boston. Um, we continue to struggle to bring, you know, diverse officers um, of all ranks to, um, uh, to D4, but also to the city. You know, what resources are, can you talk about what are we doing to not just only diverse, right, diversify our rank and file, but our leadership? Um, again, excellent question. Uh, so the, the police department here, and, and probably the first time in its history, is the most diverse at the top of the leadership in, in ever, you know, in the history of the police department. Um, the middle and the lower portions, I mean, we have a lot to work on. But it also begins by the number of, of, of certainly people of color that we bring on as police officers. It starts there and then doing all we can to make sure that we develop uh, those personnel to take exams and actually make sure that the exams are fair so that they can get promoted as well around some of that stuff. And so I know um, civil services has had some issues with their exam and I don't, I, we haven't gotten any feedback yet on how they're going to address some of those concerns. But uh, as a department, we're committed to making sure that we put out both fair exams and more importantly, making sure that people are prepared to take those exams. Uh, definitely when it comes to you know people that maybe were uh, previously um, overlooked and during that exam process in general. Thank you. And um, Superintendent um, Colin, you spoke about um, um, bringing community policing, um, and I, I would like to uh, point to the budget where we're, we're taking a look at Code 19 and walk and talk patrols. And in that um, line item, we see a decrease from, I believe, FY20. Uh, 21 until now, I believe it's like half the amount. Uh, so I, I would love to kind of see, you know, the vision of community policing that, you know, Commissioner Cox speaks to, uh, reflected, you know, in the data, but also, you know, where a lot of our constituents, whether it's Bowdoin, Ashmont Station, Geneva, Common Square, they will also like to feel that presence in um, uh, visibility of those walk and talks in Code 19. So how do we get your vision Right, reflected in the data uh, that we're presenting in the budget, but also into action um, on the streets. Yeah, uh, and that's it's how we capture it in a lot of ways, and making sure that we capture it correctly in our in our you know records management system. You know, th there's a bunch of things that we're doing, particularly as the summer months come out and involve where you're going to see more walking beats and better in general, uh, and. I, I know recently uh, one of our deputy superintendents that had the announcements put out there where offices are, you know, encouraged actually during their day to remind them to engage the public and, and build trust and things of that nature. We're going to do a whole host of things in making sure that the officers understand, you know, what that means, that they're encouraged to, not only encouraged to, but um, certainly directed to in a lot of ways uh, around that, particularly this, this summer where we're, we're intentionally making sure we're doing all we can to do that. Uh, these community comms tests that we might have you heard talked about it is another way of doing that when we're engaging the, um, the community groups in general and providing data more importantly introducing officers to the to the group at there so they can get to know some of the officers and more importantly get to give us some real feedback on what they're observing and what they think about the data around crime and fear of crime as well as to share as much information as we can to um, address fear and more importantly to, to provide information on how to stay safe in general. So we're doing a, a whole host of things to try to make sure that not only we're just saying it, that we're actually doing it and then putting some measures around it through our records management system and capturing it in different ways that maybe we've done in the past. Uh, it is weird. I looked at the number and it says, well, how's that number going down? Well, you know, you know, maybe the understanding of what a code 19 is versus what we're asking to do might be a little different. but. We're going to put measures on it so we can show it in general. I appreciate it. And thank you for your attention at Bowdoin and Geneva. I uh, just want to make sure that, you know, what we implement there is sustainable. And, that, and if we can implement, you know, uh, what we did there to Common Square, Geneva, and other parts of the district. That is the goal. That is the goal. Yes. Awesome. And then um, the budget. Oh, sorry. Oh. 
Okay. Um, I just wanted to say I've gotten a lot of positive feedback as well about Bowdoin Geneva, and our, our goal is to replicate that across the city. And additionally, uh, we're, we're getting officers outfitted that um, are ride bicycles within the district so that they're out, out there as well. So that's another additional measure we're looking at. I appreciate that. And then um, the budget request for contractual services um, in the police commission's office has doubled in the last two years. Um, what contracted services are required by the office um, and can any be brought in-house? Um, and can you provide a breakdown of the total contractual services and a breakdown of the increase? Um, I think it's like a $1. million increase. I know some of that's going to Youth Connect um, and then some of the uh, um, the, the accreditation, um, can you just provide a breakdown of what that is? So, those, Counselor, those contracted services, like you mentioned, include Kalia. They also include the 582000 for Youth Connect, 100000 for external listening sessions, 110000 for our records management system license. There is one employment contract for an individual who's come back to provide assistance with training in the 911 call center. Um, and I believe those are the larger items. But the reason for the increase uh, is most predominantly the Youth Connect funds, which also fall within the police department. To go back to a question earlier, was because the, one of the goals through the Boys and Girls Club is to allow for police officers to make referrals to Youth Connect, which has been a very successful program citywide that has totaled approximately 365 referrals from our young people to the Youth Connect uh, program and all the resources that come with it. No, I love the program, Youth Net. But can you can you can we get that um, that breakdown to the chair? Thank you. Um, and then, can you provide a clarification on what indirect costs are used for, um, and why the increase this year? Um, under personnel, um, it is line item. Uh, go back to the page. It is line item five one eight zero zero under personnel services, and it's a $143,000 uh, increase, but it has fluctuated um, up and down from FY21 until now. So that, the, the indirect costs are associated um, directly with our external funds, with the grants. So um, most grants you have to pay a, like a 10% a, a indirect cost as part of the grant program, and that pays for any administrative costs to get the grant up and running. Um, it also pays for any um, benefits related to, okay. to that. So that's, it's, it's usually a, a flat amount that's paid, but it's based on the amount of the award. It's, the percentage is flat, but it's, it fluctuates based on the amount of the award, and that's through external funds only. All right, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Rowe. Councilor Arroyo, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you to our panel for sort of committing the day to this. I uh, really appreciate your time. I want to also note Nora and uh, Officer Chen for the work that they do. I know that you're now at the training, uh, which is in my district, uh, and that community policing is a big part of where we want to go, not as a catchphrase, not as, as a thing people say, but as a, as a practical reality of what that looks like. Um, and so I, I support that vision. Um, but I want to get into a couple of different things. One of them, uh, Councilor Louis Jen touched on earlier, the recent court case where essentially the, the defense was everybody does it, it's the culture, it's accepted. And essentially, to make it just sort of layman's terms, the judge's finding or the jury's finding on that was that if the Boston Police Department had a problem with it, they'd have solved it, and they hadn't. And so I think the question that I have specifically around that is what what changes and sort of the overtime request process or the over, how overtime is granted uh, or asked for or requested are going to take place or have already taken place under this administration. So if you have some forward-looking plans that haven't been implemented yet but you're, you're getting ready to do that or if you have things that you've already implemented, since this case has been ongoing, obviously the decision, these, these things I believe were indicted prior to your time. So I don't know if there's things that you've already implemented since you've been in to sort of change this with some knowledge of this sort of issue or if there are things that are coming. But specifically, are there changes in the overtime request process and fulfillment and how those are granted uh, that are taking place? So thank you, excellent question. So uh, some of it, and I'm not totally familiar with all the cases, it is a little old mm -hmm. history, but it had to do with uh, certainly some uh, gaps we had 
around the structure and management and evidence management and, and, and supervision, I'll be quite honest with you. Uh, a lot of those, many of those, I would say almost all of those have been filled. It's much stronger supervision over there. They've had, they, they put mechanisms in place. Um, they reorganize the, uh, the evidence unit over there in general. And so a lot of that, you know, revolving around that particular case has been addressed. Uh, the, um, the, the issue around the culture of overtime, you know, it's, it is something that it needs to be authorized, and that is something we're in advance of, of, of what's occurring, and so we're, we're doing all we can to make sure that that is the case, and, re, and this gets to stronger supervision, stronger management practices, of which we are we're starting to implement across the board, and that comes from development and, and, and making sure supervisors understand their role and job and the impact that it has. On, on our resources and, and actually the role that they play in the police in general. So we are nowhere near the end. It's, a, it's an evolving evolution. We always need to, to work on making sure these things are, are strong, but moving towards accreditation really does a lot of things around that. It tightens all our policies and procedures. It, it you know, the number one thing about accreditation, if we do it, is there's someone who comes in and actually gets proofs that we're actually doing what we say we're going to do around mm -hmm. some of this. So stuff. there's some outside accountability. Yeah, absolutely. It's a total outside accountability. But before that, you have to make sure things are in place uh, in, in between. And so us. I guess, and because of the time, I don't yeah, I know I'm sometimes sorry. these it looks like everybody's cutting everybody off, and I, and I think your answer is is strong. Yeah. My question really is, is there is there specific mechanisms that you can already speak to as like this is how it used to be fulfilled, but now there's a process where they have to go to these people or to these gotcha. individuals? Is there a specific mechanism in place that's already happened, or is there a mechanism coming in place? I think your answer was good, but I'm looking yeah. more specifically for. And then I would now want to be fair to your question, so I'm going to defer for a second. Is anyone here to want to speak to that? I, about a particular thing and an example, yeah. because again, that case was before I... Yeah, that case was before your time. We can certainly speak to changes that were made directly within the evidence management unit. Um, well, so I'm thinking more so, so here's, so let me wrap this up around other things. So in 2015, there was an audit done at BPD. You've heard, uh, people, you've been here for a while, you've heard me bring up this 2015 audit. Sometimes I feel like I'm one of the only people who read it. But essentially, one of the things it says is that BPD used to operate on the idea of banks or uh, there's a bank of overtime for this department. So basically, you have overtime, but to this amount. And then if you get past that amount, then we're going to start basically asking questions. And I think there's been some changes to that since 2015. But my question is specifically, when it comes to I'm, I'm a captain or I'm somebody who's making a request for an overtime shift or for something to happen in overtime, Where's the oversight on whether or not that overtime is actually deemed necessary or not? Who is making that call? Is it a situation where there are multiple people making that call, so there's levels to that? Or is there a direct person whose role it is to approve that? Yeah, Council, I, I would say, um, you know, my experience, you know, over the last several years, to your point, um, you know, overtime and, and, and who's making the decisions, you know, could depend on, you know, you have, you have a district operating day to day, then you have larger events. So what I'd say is, you know, the districts, and I think there has been a huge emphasis on it, that the captain that's running that, the lieutenants there, and the sergeants, right? So it's accountability that these captains are looking at their overtime mm -hmm. and questioning, you know, why it's needed in the request coming through. Hey, we need overtime for this. Now you have a captain that'll say, he or she might say, you know, I, I don't, do we really need five people versus four? So I think you have that, that accountability there. The larger events, then you have captains that go up through the chain of command, you know, your command staff, you go through your deputy superintendent and your bureau chief. So my experience is you do see that there is accountability, there is that conversation in, in, in you know, analysis of the overtime and the questioning of it coming from the top all the way to the bottom. Um, you know, the commissioner said, I think, you know, he's spot on with it. You know, I think it always, it always falls on supervision, right? So if you don't have those layers of supervision, then you're gonna have problems. But I, I think we're in a place that, you know, and we'll speak for the, um, the bureau chiefs, um, but they do do it, and we do do it at captain's meetings, at Comstat. We reiterate the importance of overtime um, in making sure that everything's being done the right way. And so here's sort of the more complicated aspect of this. Uh, and I got, I think, I don't know, like two minutes, so we'll see how this goes. But for me, one of the issues with this is that uh, when we've had uh, the Boston Police Patrolsmen Association here in the past discussing things like uh, disability pay, uh, disability injuries uh, going out uh, with catastrophic injury. They'll often talk about 
the salary and what the base pay is and what they're used to. And essentially, there's a very clear understanding that when you get overtime to the degree that individuals are getting overtime, so I'm living off of a $200,000 check over 10 years because I've got this overtime thing. So it's consistently happening. A cut to overtime would essentially be a cut to those to those checks, essentially. If you're cutting overtime appropriately, then somebody's going to have to adjust for making 200000 because, say, you're short-staffed or for whatever reason that is happening, they're now to 150, 145, whatever that is. Those are significant cuts. And what we have seen from the Boston Police Patrolmen's Association is that those are just sort of seen as accepted salary. That's my salary now. My salary is this overtime plus my base pay. That's my salary. And they get accustomed to that salary. And so one of the things that I've found difficult because I'm a human being and I don't know that I would be cutting my own pay that way. So if you were saying to me, hey, how, how can we uh, adjust this so that you're not doing unnecessary salary, but then that means that people I work with or people who I'm working with would have to take substantial hits to what they're used to living on. I could see how that could be a problem if there's not a structure that essentially is meriting that each and every single one of these things is necessary. And so to that case specifically, and I'll leave those officers who were in leadership at the time that I spoke to off the record, but there was a belief that essentially because these officers in the evidence unit, if they could get this work done in two hours and somebody else would take four hours, then yeah, they should have got paid for the four hours. But that's not really how that works, right? You don't, you, we don't do it that way. And so I guess the reason I say that is there might be some changes in these structures, but who's making sure that the supervisors, because there's an affinity to who they are, to their team, there's a real affinity to teamwork to what you do, that they're not making sure that folks aren't getting decreases in overtime in ways that impact their salaries, in a way that impact their livelihood situations in terms of, I'm accustomed to living on this. If you cut it to this, then I'm now, I'm dealing with something different. How are we making sure that folks are doing things that I would understand would be difficult for supervisors, for folks on their own to do? Whose role essentially is it? Who, who's the, who, at the end of the day, whose role is it to say, you guys requested this kind of overtime, and we know that a little bit of that was not necessary. I, I'm going to simplify it for you, and it might not be the answer you're looking for. It might be. It, it's part of my role and the leadership's role to make sure that that gets pushed down throughout the whole department. Um, the need that you might be talking about in reference to it, it doesn't fit the circumstance of where we are today. If people want to do additional work, we have a detailed system that's, that's there's more details than we, we have people we could possibly cover, right? And that's, that has nothing to do with overtime. So if they want to earn additional dollars and they have free time to do it, there's a system in place to do that. And so all the other overtime that's related should be intentional around making sure we're providing public safety. And that's not, to be honest, public, that's not a patrolman's role and duty mm -hmm. to determine that. That is our management's role and duty to make sure that we're intentional about where we're putting offices and in, in, in where they're placed and when overtime exists or not. And that's what we're trying to do around everything that we do. And that's why we're data and intelligence driven. So events that require all everybody to be involved will be involved and we'll have more offices there. We are trying to be intentional across the board in every single category of what we do to make sure that that doesn't happen and exist. But right now, currently, the needs outweigh um, the number of people that we have. Gotcha. And so you're talking about a culture issue, but I don't necessarily know if it's the same issue now because we're at a different place. Okay, so, so I'm gonna go, time. just because I don't know how much time I got left and I don't know if we're doing a second round or we're saving it for the next, well, that tells me how much time I got left. <laughs> uh, do we have a second round or we just wait until the afternoon? We have a second round. Okay. Can I ask my next question? Or last should I wait? Question. Hey, last question of this round. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, so to, uh, ask this last question for this round. Details uh, were brought up, uh, and there's also administrative roles that are done by officers who could uh, be out working uh, outside of the building. These are two contractual issues, which I understand they're not within your power to implement. But one of the issues that I come across when I try to work through this is how much of our deficit can be solved if we simply civilianize some of these other roles, and then how much of our deficit is sort of the creation of poor implementation. And what I mean by that is, if we are covering, so if we have a certain number at the district level, and then we have a certain number in specialized units, 
what would that look like if we either dis decentralize those specialized units and or increase the number at the district level and decrease the number in those specialized units? These are questions beyond my ability to make determinations on. I believe you are the best folks to make those determinations. But I do wonder how much of this overtime is driven by, for lack of a better word, sort of poor management of how we put these places in place and how much of those roles uh, that are civilianized could help take care of some of these deficits that we find ourselves on. Uh, and then details I'll say for a whole different thing because there's a separate sort of context to that. But I guess the question is, how many roles do you have right now that are civilian roles, sort of not civilian roles rather, but administrative roles that are being covered by uh, officers, sworn officers? So. You asked the multiple questions on this. I asked one. you yeah. like 28. They were like last questions. <laughs> so, so I was like, let me make it one long I, question. I, let, me, I, let, me, let me say this, that, that civilianization does serve a role, right? And certainly, you know, officers, duties that officers don't necessarily need to do, if civilians can do it and help officers get back out, yes, it can help. Like amongst other things, mm -hmm. it can help. It, it's not a total solution. But yeah, it's not a cure-all, which I'm not, I don't want anybody to hear me say that I think that's a cure-all. It absolutely can help, but one of the other things, factors that you know, maybe we didn't talk about is that we have civilian openings that are out there, right? We, we are not maxed out on the civilian side. We have openings across the board in our police department. So if civilians have these openings that actually they have to support what police do, and then we don't have them, you know, it, it, we somebody has to do the work, right? And and so and the work is not stopping coming, and, and so you know we're in a position where we need people. We need people to want to join our organization because we we help the public in so many different ways, and that's mm -hmm. why we go back to the narrative about what we do and how we do it. It's so important for people to understand the good work that we do, so we can attract people to do some of these positions and jobs. And so, what was your last question you said? I'm sorry. So, so essentially what, what I'm trying to figure out is, because you went to the administrative yep. stuff, because I was talking about the administrative stuff, but there's also a question there about when we're making staffing decisions about how many people go in specialized units, how okay. many people yep. go into Thank the you. districts, yep. when we're making those kinds of decisions, yep. why they're not decentralized, yep. why they're centralized. Oh, no, I got you. And so, we're also a major city, and, and uh, we're a big city. And, and specialized units are, are kind of like, if we were in the medical profession, our specialized units are like the surgeons of, of, of our department. And so, you know, they go out and cut out the cancer or they do these special surgeries around knee replacement or things of that nature. And that's one of the benefits of having a, a, you know, a bigger city where you could specialize and be really good at targeting um, maybe some of the people that are driving the violence. And so if we have to restrict and take those units away, and become a general practitioner, we don't necessarily get the benefit of being able to go in and cut out cancers and do things of that nature within the city around that. And so we want to hold on to our specialized I'm units. certainly, I certainly think specialized units have a role, but, but to my specific question is about the decentralization of them. In other words, we had a motorcycle unit that would assemble for when they were needed yeah. for things, but would otherwise be housed at the district level. And so, and that was, I believe, only one. I don't know how any other units had that sort of role. Why aren't we doing something similar with these other units? And I will say this, that we are looking at all our resources Fantastic. at all times to make sure if they're not part of the bigger whole, <laughs> that they're used appropriately to make sure that we, where we have deficits, that we're not you know, driving on the back of the offices in the district. We are absolutely doing that right now. Thank you. That was, that was more so my question. Okay. Thank you. And I'll leave it there. Thank you for Apologize. the indulgence, uh, Ms. Chair. Uh, thank you, Council Baker. I'm sorry. Council Baker Royal. was next, yes. Council Baker was next. Um, if Council <laughs> Baker is watching this from behind the doors, it's your turn, Council Baker. If not, I'll proceed to my questions and then we can go to Council Baker. Um, so the Office of uh, Police Accountability um, and Transparency showed the field interaction um, observation encounter data with, uh, which reveals the black, that black people of all genders made up 72% of those of FIOEs, I guess field interaction observation encounter, in Roxbury Grove Hall neighborhood districts, um, which has the highest number of these interactions compared to other neighborhoods in the zip code, in other zip codes, um, at 21%, 21 21.67% 21 um, higher. So, can we? Can you please tell me how is the uh, representation of Black people in this data 
taken into consideration in terms of planning police policy or procedures for stop and frisk? So we don't have a stop and frisk policy around that right now. We, we you know, that's not who we're, what we're about or doing. Um, and without having the data in front of me, or, or actually some research assisted, you know, you know, certainly uh, in, in, in intersecting that information, I can't really speak to it, but I can speak to this a little bit, is that in, in some of the communities where we have the highest crime in general, particularly around homicides and shootings, they tend to be very diverse communities around that. And so the FIOs are really a document where we're documenting that you know the exchange or contact that we have with the public, we have to document that. I'm not, I'm not saying enough. In, in it's a, a diverse, community, it's in a, a diverse community, community so that like the likelihood of the interaction with black people is higher. Is that what you're saying? No, no, no. I'm saying in, in areas where there's you know a, a lot of high crime uh, incidents, particularly around homicides and, and shootings and things of that nature, they and it doesn't matter where it is. Victimization of, of, of folks tend to look similar to the people that they're around, you know, and that's this is a set that goes across the board in general. And so, um, not to go back in time, but uh, at one point in time, Boston had a bank robbery issue uh, that might have occurred in Charlestown, things of that nature. If police officers were focusing on people in that uh, in that particular group neighborhood that might have been doing that, or at least we suspected that they might have looked a certain way, um, and it has nothing to do with the you know race or things of that nature. It had to do with the the crime activities that were going on. Your question is: Is it's a high population of people of color that are FIO? I can't sit here and, and and say for you know for a fact you know, what the reasons are behind that. I can say what the likelihood reasons are, is that this is where we're focusing our energy and effort to make sure people are safe. And then when we have an encounter or an exchange with, with folks during that, we document it if we have FIOs around that. And so we're documenting every single one of those occurrences, what happened, and that's what the data shows. I think need, more research certainly needs to be done to actually dive deep into what, what that means around that. And, and I'm not, I don't think I'm skilled enough right now around the information you just put out there to be able to give a specific answer as to the, the exact reason why. Okay. Um, you mentioned that there was going to be a training, and I apologize for the old mm -hmm. language in um, stop and frisk, but uh, you mentioned that there, were, there was going to be training as specifically to dealing with um, police officers, to training police officers with coping mechanisms or skills. Um, so that they can take better care of their mental health, um, experiencing high-inducing uh, or trauma-inducing um, environment or field. Um, how are you also doing that training for officers in terms of dealing with people that um, have trauma or that is trauma triggering? informed? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think we do quite a bit of training, particularly our our, our, our outreach uh, officers. So. We want to come in training. We do quite a bit of training in general. I can speak to this very intimately because I developed a curriculum for the Mass Massachusetts Municipal Police Massachusetts Municipal Police Training Committee for this past in-service uh, program year uh, that dealt specifically with trauma-informed approaches, and it addresses. Um, police officers' interactions with individuals and having a trauma-informed approach um, and looking at everyone uh, as if they have a trauma history. So um, it's specifically being addressed on a state level through in-service this year. Um, I've been in conversations with Superintendent Baston to also um, roll out that curriculum with this upcoming recruit class as well. Can you list the clinical trainings that that includes your curriculum? The clinical trainings? Yes, so trauma-informed training includes um, psychotropic med training, it includes wraparound, it includes, so they're specific, so, so the language is not sort of like a blanket just to say we're training people on how to deal with situations. The, 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 the terminology actually encompasses a host of like clinical trainings. And I'm just wondering um, if 
you 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 planning to collaborate with institutions to bring those clinical trainings? I can get I can get you the information around the training curriculum, um, and I I'm, I'm not sure if the academy is doing what additional things the academy is doing, and they can speak to that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have some information that I'd like to just request on record, um, and if you don't, if you can't provide it today, um, all of the information that um, I know that uh, Council Rell, Council Lara, uh, Council Royal asked for things to um, through the chair to um, be responded to, um, and I ask obviously that you know you send it within a couple of days or within at least five business days so that we have enough time to review them prior to the working session. Or if there, there is a block for time for uh, BPD uh, backup, um, and that's in the event that we don't get questions answered so that we can schedule another hearing with you. Um, and hopefully that's not the case, because I have plenty of hearings. Um, but uh, just generally uh, requests for, um, can you get a detail of, I would like to detail spreadsheet um, that will break down a 2021 to 2022 and 2022 to 2023 police budgets by line item and bureau and what actually uh, was what was actually spent for each line item, what was the budget for permanent employees and actual spending for permanent employees in FY19, FY20, FY21 and FY22. Um, I will read all of these into record. Feel f you don't have to write them down. I can provide it to you in, in writing. Um, what was the budget for permanent employees and what is the projected actual spending for permanent employees in FY23? During last year's budget process, BPD provided minimum um, manning levels of each police district. Uh, please, uh, if you can provide an update list of it, minimum manning levels and actual staffing levels per district, including both the overall staffing levels and any additional actual staff levels per shift in each district. Explain if there are more details for what minimum manning levels consist of. Example, a specific number of different types of officers, patrols, car units, et cetera, et cetera. Provide data on how many overtime hours are used to reach minimum manning levels per district because, because of um, the number of officers um, is below that level um, where overtime is used on routine basis to fill the gap. Um, provide data on how many overtime hours are used to reach minimum manning levels per district because obviously officers are unable to work a shift due to a vacation, et cetera. Uh, provide data on how many officers, um, officer hours are typically dedicated each, each year to each district from specialized citywide units in the Bureau of Fields um, Services, Bureau of Investigative Service, and Bureau of Community Engagement, Youth Violence, Strike Force, a special, special operation citywide bike unit, street outreach, et cetera. Um, I have many more requests. They will be on this sheet. I yield my time because I know that I have to be fair to my colleagues. Um, I will submit them to you uh, today um, and also by email so you can have them. Um, and if we can have that information, that would also be great. Um, I think I had just one other question. Can you explain um, why the spending up to date per pension annuity workers, and this is maybe something that I just need clarification to understand a little bit better, um, workers' compensation, indirect cost, and Medicare have not been spent at all yet? This is for pension? You're making reference to It's a pension and annuity, workers' compensation, indirect cost, and Medicare. And it could just, if it's an error in the raw data, then that's fine. Can you reference what, what you're looking at, Council, please. Um, I actually did not uh, put down the page number, but I could submit that to you as well. That would be great if you could. No problem. Uh, what is the reason for fluctuation in personnel services from FY21 to FY22? So, increased by 5,000 FY22 to FY23. 
cut by 14 million, um, $22,110 in FY23 to FY24, increased by $7,905,747. Mm -hmm. So I guess just looking for the reasoning behind the inflectuation. The could, you, could you possibly, when you send that question over, the reference of what you're referring to, so we can kind of. So I guess, page. what's the reason for the fluctuation in personnel services? So in total personnel cap costs. Yeah. So from FY21 to FY22, there was an increase, and FY22 to FY23 cut by, but then FY23 to FY24 increased by seven million. So I guess just looking for the reason behind the fluctuation, trying to understand how you are going up or down. Are you, I'm sorry, are you looking at the actuals or are you looking at the actual budget numbers for personnel costs? So when you go to personnel costs, um, personnel services, and this is just how I'm getting the, the data in the breakdown of personnel. When you look for years prior, um, you, you went from, in FY22 to FY22, for personnel services. And there was, there was an increase of 5,000. In FY22 to FY23, there was a cut for personnel services. I mean, you have your information on personnel services, right? Yes, you I You don't do. see the cut from FY22 to FY23. Maybe you only brought today, this year's? No, I'm, lo I'm looking you have actually right overall. Now at the department variance do you, report. Do you see that there's a cut of 14 million, and then do you see that there's an increase of 7 million? You know that there's an increase of 7 million this year, right? Yes, yeah. I do. So I just, I wanna know why. The increase of 7 million this year is, is related to uh, collective bargaining agreements uh, for all civilian um, unions being settled this year. Uh, there's also an increase as a result of the reclassification of 911 operations call center that incurred that happened in August of 2022, um, and those employees we got that increase in in November of this year. It also includes step increases that officers are entitled as they, they you know from three years to five years to ten years to fifteen years. Those step increases are reflected in their salary um, scales, and that also relates to the increases in personnel services, along with um, you know an increase. A, a cadet class of 60 is reflected in that number as well, mm -hmm. along with um, possibly a new class in fiscal year 2024 for um, a new academy class. Um, and then for FY22 to FY23, there was a cut. Are you, is it actuals of the cut? Um, yes. I have a. Um, I have a, a, a chart that we basically get the raw data from the books and we created a chart in comparison from 2020 to 2024. And I'm just ask. I see the fluctuation going from, again, 21 to 22, 5,000. And then when you go to 22 to 23, 14. And then when you go to 23 to 24, it went up. It's going up seven. That's why I'm just I'm just wondering the reason for the fluctuation. You've given me the reason for 23 to 24. Um, happy to submit that information in writing as well. And yes, it is an actual personnel. And then to answer your question about um, where, where is it? Where did you put it? Where, where, where is my sheet? Where is it?
Thank you. Um, so for, question, for my first question, um, explaining why uh, information, uh, pension, annuity, workers, compensation, and direct costs in Medicare, uh, it was actually based on the FY, F, RFI information that you provided. Um, so again, I'll, I'll yield my time and come back to my questions. Um, I wanted to be respectful of my colleagues. Uh, first, Council Baker, you, you're back. You have the floor. Thank you have eight minutes, Council Baker. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, everyone. Commissioner, how are you today? Um, I don't have many questions, but just some clarification. On the, um, we had some grants here that were for, uh, Data analytic positions, I believe, for the for the brick. Where is what is the status of those grants? Were you able to get them, or are they still kind of here? No, I, I don't believe we were. If, can you elaborate on that? The the needed positions, though. The um, the grant money is here, but it's held in suspense in the Treasury Department until we, we receive approval of an accept and expend from city council. From city council, yes. okay. So, so how do we move that forward? Does that have to come over? It's, it's, it's in a docket someplace, so we could just pull it out off the green sheets. You, are you familiar, or would that have the process need to start over again, like through the mayor's office? If there isn't an existing docket for it, Councilor Baker, we can certainly re-engage the process to bring those items before the council for approval. Okay. Um, okay, I think we should look at doing that. Um, and can we talk about Mass and Cass a little bit? How is, how is the outreach team, the outreach unit, what are their numbers now and what does the future look like for them? Like, do we plan on beefing that up at all? It, maybe even coming into s more neighborhoods, a, 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 larger, a larger team so they could say, come to Dorchester and help us out a little bit? And, and so certainly they do a great job wherever they are, and we'd love to increase it. Uh, remember, we're working from the same body of people yeah. <laughs> throughout the whole city, so I, I don't know if, if we will be able to enhance it in the, in the way that you're talking about, but they do a tremendous uh, job in general. And, and what, so what are the numbers, I, I believe they fall Sweet. under you? They do. Yeah, it was, what are their numbers now? What do they have for? I know you have a lieutenant, a sergeant, and then how many, how many regular officers? Um, I, I want to say we have six officers now. So and, a, and a lieutenant and a sergeant? And a lieutenant and a sergeant, that's correct. Okay. Um, it, and does anybody know, um, not know, I'm sure everybody knows, but what is the situation down at the roundhouse down there? How, how, how often are we there? Is that something that we find ourselves dealing with a lot? I don't, I don't have that information specifically, but I know we are in that area on a daily basis, yeah. um, specifically dealing with um, the challenges around Atkinson Street. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're there on, specifically the street outreach unit is there on a daily basis. And, and also, so Roundhouse, who would get those calls? Is that, would that be, um, would that be C6? Yes. C6 would get the calls That's from? That's correct. Yeah, okay, and there's no one here from C6. Just, just curious as to what. We, I can get that information. Yeah, if we could, like, number of incidences, what, it, yes. not necessarily Atkinson Street or the surrounding areas, more specifically the Roundhouse, the Roundhouse Hotel. Yes. Councilor, okay. if I may, just to clarify, there are six patrol officers, or eight, excuse me, currently assigned to the street outreach unit. Oh, okay, okay. Um, I'm good, Madam Chair. Yeah, thank you. All right. Um, I could use a two-minute um, recess. Um, Council Lahr, if it's okay with you, thank you. Um, Council President Flynn, um, just a couple of minutes, a little restroom break. I'll be back.
Councilors and officers, are we ready? Councilors and officers, that should be a song. <laughs> we are back in session. We're, we'll uh, begin our round, uh, second round of questioning. Um, hopefully, wrap up one, two, three, four. If uh, five minutes is okay for everyone, we have another session after the, um, another hearing after this. Um, go for lunch for about an hour, and then return. Fair. Okay. Um, so five minutes, I think it's uh, Council President Flynn, then Council Lara, then Council Arroyo, then Council Baker. Councilor President Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Again, thank you, Commissioner, and your team for being here. Over the last several weeks, I had the opportunity to speak directly to officers that were also members of Jade. Of, of Mamlio, of, of the Women's Law Enforcement Organization throughout Massachusetts, um, <clears throat> talking about recruitment and retention. So, Commissioner, my question is, um, how are we able to recruit diverse backgrounds in the city, such as um, Asian officers or, or Haitian officers of, or, or others? I uh, just want to see what your thoughts are going forward, not only recruiting, but also retention as well. So we just hired a new, um, you know, certainly diversity uh, recruitment officer and in, in, in general. And so, Susie, come down and she can give a description on certainly what strategies we're going to be going for. Yep. You, that's that's right. Does this mic? Oh, perfect. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so my name is Susie Helmy. Um, you may or may not remember me. I was the former interim director for the um, Human Rights Commission. So allow me to reintroduce myself as BPD's uh, diversity recruitment officer. I've been in this role for three weeks now, and I am in the process of developing a diverse recruitment strategy. Um, so that Boston Police mirrors the constituents that we serve. Boston is incredibly diverse, and so does the, the it's a mandatory for the police department to do, be also. So this strategy will encompass everything from a bigger social media presence to intentional recruitment and intentional outreach. Um, so I'm currently developing my strategy by meeting with both internal and external stakeholders. I'll also be collaborating with my former colleagues in the Equity and Inclusion Cabinet, meeting with the directors of Black Male Advancement, Women's Advancement, LGBTQ Advancement, as they are skilled in their areas of leadership. Um, I will just end my <laughs> remarks by saying that my recruitment strategy is going to be twofold. It's to emphasize the important importance that recruitment is all year round. Mm -hmm. It is not because we have a civil service exam coming up or cadet applications are open. It's all year round. And second, recruitment is community and trust building at the same time. So my recruitment strategy is going to be very community focused. I'm going to leave it there. Thank you. Your name again? Say it again. Your name again? Susie Helmy. I remember your face. Yes. <laughs> not your name. Thank you so much. <laughs> Right. Well, well, thank you for that update. We had an opportunity to work together when you were at the Human Rights Commission, and you were very professional, hardworking. So I know you'll do a tremendous job working thank with you. the Boston Police as well. Thank you. Welcome aboard. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Commissioner. So my my next question that I wanted to that I wanted to focus on. So I, I know we spoke about it briefly. I, I think during when, when I'm driving around or in the, in the district, I see police officers that are at construction sites on, on a detail. And I know a lot of the arrests that are made, not that I want to get into the discussion on detail now, but I do know that a lot of arrests that are made um, in our city are made by 
<coughs> offices that are working um, paid details. So I just want to acknowledge that those offices, while performing another role, do provide critical public safety support for the residents of Boston. Um, and then I know there was a there was a conversation earlier about <coughs> civilians playing a more meaningful role, I guess, or doing some of the work that a an officer could could do. But I just look at the important role a police officer plays in the booking station when when someone comes in to talk to the to the district about a certain issue but the, the, the assignment person, the person's at the front desk, a police officer, plays a critical role in, in working with the public, but also sometimes there are challenges um, at the front office of the, of the uh, police, police station. Um, but those offices are also important, Commissioner. There's no, there's no plan to get rid of those offices out of the, the front desk area, is there? So there's some things certainly officers have to take as far as report, the kind of reports that we, we take in general. And, you know, r right now there's no, there's no uh, replacement of officers in certain places until we have a plan in place to make sure that we have officers in general across the board. Uh, civilianization in certain places is important, I think. Uh, you know, but as I said before earlier, we have openings both on the civilian mm -hmm. side and the sworn side right now. So we don't have an abundance of one to be able to, to do that with another. We need people across the board. Thank you, Commissioner. I, and I do acknowledge, I, I know the civilian staff at the Boston Police Department, they play a critical role and provide tremendous support to the residents, to the, to the police department. So I want, to, I want to acknowledge the civilian personnel at the Boston Police the important role they play, but there is nothing like seeing an officer in uniform doing the role of um, community policing or public safety. And um, that's, I think that's my time, isn't it, Madam Chair? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Commissioner. Council Lara. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you all for, for sticking through with us. I think that I will be able to tell the last end of my questions on this round. So I ended my last round talking about Youth Connect and where we're going to put the money in Youth Connect, and I have another question particularly around um, the Community Connections Coordinator position, and I want to preface it a little bit about why I'm asking these questions in particular. Um, some of you may know and some of you might not know that I served as a street worker for five years in the city of Boston. I started in Mattapan on Norfolk and Wilcock and then worked in Villa Victoria and Lenox. And so I have a lot of experience working particularly with young people who are gang involved doing direct violence intervention work and I'm aware of some of the limitations and the difficulties of getting this population particularly connected to services and kind of like moving them to services. And so for me, having a lot of these services and a lot of these programmings connected to the Boston Police Department pre creates a barrier, right? It creates a deterrent. And so I want to fund these, I want these things to be happening. And also, how do we make it as easy as, po as possible for this very specific population to access these services? And so when I think about Youth Connect, uh, I, again, Youth Connect is a great program, and I also know how referrals happen at Youth Connect, right, through my meeting, and I'm just like, okay, what are some of the limitations of those referrals, if the referrals are coming from officers? And when I think about the relationship between the Boston Police Department and young people who might be gang involved or who might be the impact players in their neighborhood, what are, what is, what part of that relationship is informing who you think is worth helping, worth making the recommendation, and then how much of that can be mitigated by having it be at a school or at a you know at a community center, or the Boys and Girls Club, and so on and so forth. And so that is that is that's my that's from doing that work. That's kind of like that's my understanding and what I've known from my experience. And that's why I'm kind of talking about this this thinking about how we move some of these resources out of the Boston Police Department, fund them still at this level, but create remove that barrier. And so for Boston schools, there was recently a position designated to collaborate with the police department and focus specifically on gang-involved youth, and they were called the Community Connections Coordinator. It was originally in the Boston public school budget. BPS has said that um, 
was moved to the police budget. I don't know where that community um, community coordinator, connections coordinator position is. So what is BPD's involvement in the community connections position? Where? I can't find it. And so BPS told us that it's not with them, that it's with you. I can't find it in the BPD budget. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not aware of a community connection coordinator with the Boston Police. Okay, so you're we, not aware. we do not have that position yeah. in our budget. Okay, that's what I thought. I just wanted to double check. Because also when we talked to BPS, we had a hearing about restorative justice process and we talked about our concerns with this position. BPS said to us, we heard feedback from the community, we heard feedback from parents, we're not um, going to implement this position anymore. And then we heard that it was somehow moved, so I just wanted to double check on that. Um, there are uh, as you know, I held a hearing about the police contract here on the Boston City Council. I think the Boston Police contract is a policy document, and I think that it's important for us to really keep an eye on it. So my next questions are about that. There's $81 million in the proposed FY24 budget for collective bargaining reserves. For the previous year's existing collective bargaining fund, so the amounts that were allocated for FY23, how much is remaining in that fund that we spend it down completely? To my knowledge, we have not spent the reserves down for the collective bargaining agreements for, for the patrolmen's associates because they're still in negotiation. The FY23 allocations are basically still in the pot because we don't have the we don't, contract. We don't have a uh, collective bargaining agreement. So we haven't ratified. spent any of what was in the FY23 budget, particularly for um, collective bargaining reserves. Correct. Thank for, you. for the sworn for the sworn um, for the sworn officers. CBAs. Correct. So I guess that, that brings me to my next question. Besides the police association, what unions still have contracts um, through twenty twenty three that are not settled? It's it's all the all the sworn, which would be the uh, Boston Patrolmen's Association, yep. the detectives, mm -hmm. the superiors, and the superior detectives. Got it, so four. Yes, correct. Total. Um, how many unions do you think will have contracts between July of this year and June of next year that are not settled yet? Are you hoping that? And I know, there's, I know that this is obviously dependent on the collective bargaining process and there's not much that you can say in that respect, but anticipation-wise. Yeah, well, we don't have a crystal ball on that. That's part of mm -hmm. negotiations and, and certainly that you know, we're involved in as well as the city. Okay. <coughs> so I, I guess those are really my questions because my, what I would like to know is how much of the 81 million is gonna might go to the police department, but I think that I can also take a look at the previous contracts and see where we've seen the increases and kind of take a, a, an educated guess about how much of the 81 million dollars is gonna go for the collective research is gonna go. Those reserves are only for the contract. Right? The, for the contracts. Yeah, so I just wanna make sure we're clear. Mm -hmm. Those reserves are specifically for the contracts. So yes. if it's settled, it pays. Yes, whatever the, the difference contract. is there, exactly. Right. Yeah. So it, it wouldn't go anyplace else. Yes, that I know. Yes, I'm aware. Thank you for clarifying that. So the proposed budget increase for the BPD is to four or five million dollars, um, and obviously, we don't have a crystal ball like you said. So this is going to change further depending on the results of the contract negotiation, um, and because various of those contracts are under negotiation, for me, I would really like to understand. Um, the relationship between those contracts. And so my question is not necessarily to be answered now, um, is about the pay raises that happened between all of those. So I would like to see between 2017 and 2018, between 2018 and 2019, 2019, 2020, like what were the, what increases we saw in those, um, in those contracts so that we can kind of take an educated guess about what kind of increases we might be looking at. Obviously the cost of living has changed a lot and I'm sure that that's something that's being considered in the negotiations, but if it would help really consider this an official request through the chair, because um, I think it'll help us kind of take what that is. And do you have the number for what the health insurance pensions and other costs for VPD are? No, I, I do not. I don't okay. have that information here. If, if I'm not mistaken, health, health insurance and, and pensions costs would be something that, you know, a deducted for your paycheck, but that's reflected on the city's general fund. It's not reflected in our budget. We're just our salary costs are purely just our, our compensation, mm -hmm. doesn't reflect our fringe benefits, which wouldn't be pension, um, health insurance, et cetera. That does not sit on the operating budget for the police department. Okay, so, and you don't know what that number is out of the city's total? Not, not right now, I could, I could find out though for you. Yeah, absolutely, no, no rush, thank you at all. Madam Chair, I know that that was, uh, is that my time? Yeah, uh, final question. Um, we are coming back in an hour. Yeah, we are coming back in an hour, so no. I will stop there. Thank I'm you. Fine. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Arroyo. Uh, because we are coming back in an hour and I'm cognizant that folks should get some lunch, I want to just ask 
one question uh, that might require some more time, but just one, which is uh, in 2022, we saw a judge uh, make a ruling against civil service examinations for the fact that they were uh, racially biased. This has been a long, a long standing issue, and I've, I myself have seen, uh, I'm not the first counselor in this seat, and so other uh, that has my last name, and so I have seen conversations over time about, you know, maybe we remove civil service, maybe we don't. And so in the context of this question, I guess it's sort of three parts to this question, which is, one, I'm aware, because I've been made aware that there's a sort of a looming retirement, there's sort of an age gap at BPD. So there's a, a looming several waves of retirement sort of at some point in that when that happens, there's a possibility that the diversity numbers that we have now will be even lower. And so obviously this ruling against civil service examination, how that impacts promotions and things of that nature uh, is sort of well timed. But I guess the question in terms of repairing that, I think the question for me though is one, it's my understanding that the civil service is something we opt into which would sort of say that we can opt out. And so my question is, in your eyes, what are the benefits, if any, or the presumed benefits, if you, if you don't want to say definitively that this is a benefit, but rather this is something that presumably it does, of being involved in the civil service examination process? What are the cons, if any, of that process? And is there a, a world in which we may either now in the future seek to opt out of civil service, does that make sense? And also, uh, similarly, are you aware, I know Springfield, which has had some of its own issues as a department, um, but does have some kind of sort of different uh, implementation is my understanding of how they work with civil service or, or how civil service impacts them. Um, and I'm not as versed on that. So if you're not as versed on Springfield, don't worry about it. You're the Boston Police Department, not Springfield Police Department. Uh, and so I'm more so asking, is this something within our control? What are the detrimental aspects of this as you see it to the force in terms of sort of recruitment and promotion? Uh, what are the positives that it may be bringing, if any? Why, why, why keep it, for instance? And then is this something that we think in the future, not definitively we will get rid of necessarily, but is it something worth exploring whether it is of use to the Boston Police Department? Thank you. Another very deep and uh, thoughtful question. Um, and, and I try. The fact, uh, well, the, the fact is, is that you know this is something we're evaluating. Uh, certainly, you know, since I've been here, and probably even before I, I came. I mean, civil service, uh, um, you know, provides p protection for a lot of officers, and it was, you know, created during a period of time to make sure there was fairness involved with exams, and, and make sure there was no political involvement uh, with uh, the process. Um, has it outlived its day? I don't know. Right. That's mm -hmm. a that is certainly a question, a fair question to ask. What are the impediments that it presents? It, right now, when we're trying to recruit people to come on to this job, particularly in Boston, it limits the, 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 you know, the pool of people we can bring in on. If we wanted to recruit from outside of Massachusetts, you know, we can't unless they took the civil service test. Uh, and so anything that's an impediment to our recruitment right now, is, 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 that's why we're you know, questioning you know, the entire process. Um, there are pros involved in it, uh, you know, and I can't enumerate all the different mm -hmm, pros mm -hmm. and cons now. And maybe this is a, something a follow-up conversation. Uh, it might be a follow-up hearing at some point, frankly. <laughs> right. So, I mean, you know, but the, but the reality is there are some pros, there are some cons. Contractually, are there some issues around that, that you know, with unions that we might have to deal with? I, I think there, there may be, certainly. Um, uh, the ability, since it's their exam, you know, lawsuits, things of that nature, when we take on that onus and, we're, you know, we could potentially be involved with more mm -hmm. lawsuits one way or the other. Uh, I don't know if that's a pro or a con. It's just a reality of, of when you take on the responsibility. In other words, just to be clear for anyone who's watching that, the civil service exam, if there's an issue with the civil service exam, they get sued. If there's an issue with your promotional sort of whatever that replaces it, then we could possibly be sued. That's true, but lawsuits tend to bring in more people than less anyway, so I don't even, <laughs> I don't even know if we can get out of it regardless of whose fault it is. Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, you know, again, you know, anything that limits our flexibility in the, in the world we live in today, it's, it's, you know, we have to reevaluate that. Um, but there were some probably very good reasons why civil service started, and, and so um, we, we, we should definitely measure twice and cut once before we, we make that decision. But it, it's something that we're thinking about, right? And going down that list.
So to be continued. If yeah, I, it's if perfect. I and, and I'll leave it there because I, I want everybody to be able to get some kind of lunch break. So thank you, Madam Chair, and I'll see you all in the second round. So thank you. Okay. Thank you, Council Arroyo. Council Baker? Thanks, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Can you um, talk, whoever wants to talk about um, our classes, what do we, like, there's one there now, how many's in there, how many, how many started, how many did we lose, like kind of so we can get a sense of, sense of what do we need to do for classes to get to a point where we feel good about our staffing. I, I, I saw one that we're averaging 122 retirements a, a year and we're only putting, what, 85 or 90 people a year on, like how do we, how do we head that off? How do we um, make that right? Um, so I'm just going to. Um, hi, Nora. Hi, hi, hello, everyone. I'm just going to speak on the current um, academy class, 6323. We started off with 166. We are at 146. Um, so and that's pretty good retention there. If you only lost 20. Yes, and and somewhat like right out the gate. Um, yeah. Most of the issues were we knew that there was a lot of family issues, so that's why we decided to have, and we're going to go forward to have family days about having the support when you're in the academy. A lot of them are moms that just had kids and didn't have you know, daycare issues or just the amount of work that is needed in the academy, but it's a big class. Um, right now we have 79 of the academy recruits speak a second language, which is tremendous, and um, about 14 speak two languages, seven speak three languages. We have someone that speaks sign language. It's a very diverse academy class. Um, and But how do you continue that? I think right now, like I said, out of the pool, I know we're about to put in a pool for July, pull the list for the next class. And so the classes are continuous. So when one graduates, we only have a month or two um, of waiting, not six or seven months. So that's what yeah, I that know was, our plan is. That was my question. Are we going to try and get more, more classes on, online? Yeah. Absolutely. And yeah. Lisa, we, can you want to speak on that, that we're already talking about the next, and that's why we put it in the budget to already have a class for the next. So once one graduates, we have, once the list is certified, we're pulling from the list and we're, we're starting our next academy class, yeah. the background checks. The mayor is committed to certainly us making sure that we get another class in with that. And so that's why we're doing it, you know, back to back here around that. She's been very, very good around supporting us in that way. Good, good. Um, in, can you talk a little bit about lateral moves? When you say lateral moves, is that different moving to other departments? And also, and this is something we've heard for, for years, people transferring out and going over the fire department. Like, how does, how does that happen? It's almost like the fire department's coming in and nothing against the fire department, but they're coming in and they're raiding the police department for their, for their people. <laughs> Can we stop that? You know, I, I, you know the, the fire departments are public safety partners, and I'm not going to you know, speak ill of them. You know, and the, and the issue is, is, is you know, we, we are different. Public, we're, we're all in public safety, but it, this is a special job, and it takes special people in some ways. And so I look, and if they joined our job, and the first chance they get to leave to go to the fire department, I would probably say maybe they didn't belong here in the first place. You know, but we should always do everything possible to make sure that we have the best environment for the people that work here in general, and, and you know, because if they're happy and healthy, and are, are you know, certainly developed, and they're going to highly likely treat the public well and, and provide a great public service. And so that's what, what our, our you know, point of emphasis is around that. Um, you know, it, it's there, you know, it, again, it's very difficult when people say that they, you know, want to come on, um, you know, to know what their intent is. But when they get here, the reality of the work that we do daily, uh, they find out very quickly if this is the job for them. And so uh, we need to do as much as we can in the, for, in the front end of it to make sure people, when they sign on, understand what they're signing on for, that we're here to serve the public, you know, that uh, the ways in which we do it and what's expected when you come on this job. So to make sure that we don't have people that leave early. All right. in, in the lateral move, so that's a move yeah. from Boston to another city or town, like where are, where are people going? Is there so laterals are, are something that we put in for. We took laterals from other, we put out a, a call for laterals from other police departments We're in Massachusetts. Coming in. Yes, due to civil service rules, they have to be from another civil service uh, police department within um, Massachusetts. And we had three laterals join our department recently. But laterals also work where our offices can go elsewhere as well. If I, you know, if I as a you know, commissioner sign off on, on that for them to be able to do that. And so 
we haven't had very many people do that, and that's a good thing. And I would expect that uh, I don't expect people to want to really do that because uh, this is a special job. You know, we we are the Boston Police Department in in the, one of the best cities in America. I, I don't know why, if you're going to be in public safety, why you wouldn't want to be here. Yeah, yeah. That was like perfect timing there, huh? Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Porrell. Uh, thank you, Chair. And I just have one question. Um, going back to contracted services, um, are we on track to, to, to spend um, what was allocated last year for contracted services? Yes, we are. Okay, because uh, I see in the RFI that we have, you know, two million budgeted and then available one point nine million dollars still available. Um, some some of that will be spent. Most of that will be spent down before June thirtieth. In that that one point nine or two million that you're looking for, that delta, um, there's money in there that will be encumbered very shortly for the detectives exam that we're planning on having in fiscal year 24. We just secured the exam administrator and we'll be securing their contract. So you'll see that go down quite significantly in the next couple of weeks. Okay, um, and then the last one would be around uh, auto energy and supplies. Yes. What, well, yeah, would, would that also be spent down before the end of the fiscal year? Yeah, it definitely will be. Actually, we're seeing obviously an increase in auto energy supplies, but that should be spent down. That, that, those, that, that will come down significantly before the end of the year. Okay. And <clears throat> no further questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, counselors, and thank you to administration. Um, we, it is now, um, let's call it one, uh, 20 past one will return um, at exactly one hour to 20. Thank you. Uh, this hearing has been um, adjourned.